her father was convicted of molesting her and her two sisters. So I go to the bathroom, come out, and I'm like, hey, I know what you did to your daughters. So when we start scrapping, I ended up like putting both hands around his neck and then I moved to get like a side position. And this guy had a bullet. He's like, you killed your dad. He goes, that night she told us that you left. Where were you all night? So my mother, I'm from Canada, obviously. Uh, my mother's from uh, a small, uh, do you know what Métis is? No. Half Native American, half white. Okay. So my mom's from a small Métis town. She's she's Métis. So a um, very small town. My grandpa was like the mayor of there and everything. And he's a politician up there and all this crap. But she was the youngest girl. There was 13 kids. She's the youngest girl. And uh, she was a bit of a hippie and she wanted to spread her wings. So she ended up moving to Toronto, Ontario. And one night at a nightclub, at my uncle's nightclub, actually, she met my father, who was apparently the six foot nine, very charming, very uh, well built man, I guess. And uh, yeah, so she fell in love with him. He actually sang Elvis Presley to her, and she was a huge Elvis fan. So um, my name was actually supposed to be Elvis, but thankfully, my cousin was born a week before me. His name's Elvis. And I was named after my dad. So that saved me a life of torment. But right. so uh, when he sang to her, she fell in love. And um, so they started hanging out. He took her around places, whatever, and made her fall in love even more. And then once she was in love, in love, he turned her out. And apparently he was a pimp. And that's why he was so charming. And uh, yeah, he put her on the streets. And so he used this, to... I'm sorry. Pardon? So this is something like this is was already something he was doing when they yeah. met yeah she just didn't have any idea yeah she didn't know so so once that happened she was already in love and then she met all these girls and then he used to sleep with all the girls and then he ended up getting my mom pregnant and then uh he married her and uh so th there's wedding pictures and stuff and i'm six months in the tummy so uh i tell everybody i was a product of the game <laughs> and um well he married her though I mean, yeah. he, he must have had some affection for. Well, it was the Italian side of the family. Right. It was a, it was the Italian family to push him towards it, I guess. But like, it's weird because my mom was a black sheep of her family. There's 12 siblings. And my dad was a black sheep of his, black sheep of his family with 12 siblings. So pretty weird. They ended up together. But um, yeah, so he ended up, well, she ended up giving birth to me. I already had an older sister that wasn't his. So she gave birth to me and um, decided this was no life for her kids and told one of the other girls she was going to move back to, to Manitoba with her family. And that girl ran to my dad and said, Jenny's planning on leaving with the kids. So my dad introduced her to crack. So she was addicted to crack for about a year that she beat it on her own, beat, beat the addiction and made the mistake of telling another lady that she was planning on coming home with the kids. My dad caught wind of it again and introduced her to heroin. So um, some of my earliest your, memories. Your dad doesn't sound like a nice person. No, not okay. at all. And okay. no, you'll hear more. You'll hear okay. more that, that just makes him a total piece of garbage. Right. So um, my earliest memories and and actually recently, because uh, I'm part of a, a class action lawsuit against a priest, I had to get a bunch of, um, what do you call it? Not particularly. It's, uh, a bunch of, I had to get all my paperwork. Sorry about that. I hit the computer. I had to get all my paperwork from, uh, from when I was in care disclosure. Sorry. I had to order all my disclosure from when I was in care and they sent it to me. There's 278 pages. And the stuff I read was just horrific. Like it was like, ah, mind boggling. And I remembered some of it. So some of my earliest memories are, um, one thing I always remember is my mom would get, changed in one of the rooms with all these ladies all the ones that worked for my dad and i'd be in there just like saying goodbye to her kind of while they're all naked getting dressed and there was a lot of bush in there that was like <laughs> that's about 85 86 so it was just <laughs> a lot of bush so anyways that's one of my earliest memories and then i remember there was a lady that used to come by and talk to my parents my dad would get mad my mom would cry and then they'd leave and what I found out later was those were social workers. And then one time they came and because there was, 
we would go door to door asking for food, asking for clothes, um, asking for money. But every time we got money, I remember my dad would take it from us. And they were leaving us alone in the apartment. Uh, there was reports of us hanging out the window on the fourth floor. Uh, there were some reports of me with a nine-year-old in the parking lot when I was four starting fires and stuff. And uh, yeah, so all the stuff I read was just very like child neglect, like major. And then um, I guess my sister went to my mom. Well, first they, they had a case open against with my family because my sister went to school bruised up. But once they met me, they saw how aggressive I was towards her and just said, oh, that's her brother beating her up. And then a year and a half later, um, my sister went to school and told the teachers that she was being sexually assaulted by my dad. So they stepped in again. Um, my dad got mad. They arrested him, brought him to the station, questioned him. And then he admitted to some of those things. And the thing that pisses me off once I read all those, the disclosure and stuff was he got less than two years for about a year of abuse to my sister. And my sister was only eight because I was only five. So my sister was eight. But some of the things I remember too was sometimes a lot of people would come to my house, they'd get high, they'd get drunk, or we'd go to, uh, what was his name? Uncle Chico's. we go to Uncle Chico's house, he had roaches, you go in the bathroom, there's all these like dirty pictures from magazines in his bathroom hung up on the walls and stuff. But we'd go there or we'd be at my house. And my dad would talk to somebody and that person would take my sister into a room and then my sister would come out crying and that person would give my dad drugs. So he was pimping out his eight-year-old stepdaughter, like right. just a total piece of shit. So, um, yeah, anyways, eventually the social workers came and they, they told us that, uh, like, I remember actually my mom taking us to arcades or restaurants and we'd be sitting in the front playing games. There was a restaurant with a Pac-Man game. We'd sit there and play it. And my mom would go in the back with the owner. So she would take us to turn tricks too and stuff. So it was quite the life. But finally, these the social workers came one day with uh, another guy. And they had this, this red car that looked like an old New York taxi, but it had a red light on top, like a siren, I guess. And they told us, grab your favorite toy. We're going to go watch a movie. So we did. And we ended up in a foster home. So they didn't take us to a movie. They brought us to a foster home. And then... Um, from what I read recently in the disclosure, my mom was missing visits. She was uh, late for visits. She'd show up drunk two hours later, try to fight everybody. They got security in the one office just because of my mom. Um, so within the first three days, we, no, sorry, four days, we ended up in four foster homes. So we went to an emergency one, went to another one. And then I remember we're sitting at the office and there was a dude with a heavy, I'm guessing it was Texas accent, but he looked at me and my sister and he's like, well, that one's pretty charming and that little fat fucker's kind of funny. So we'll take them. <laughs> they, took, they took me and my sister. So, but I, I remember him being, he was pretty cool, but it was only for overnight. And then we ended up uh, at another foster home where I stayed for, I think, two years altogether. My mom started missing more and more visits. And uh, one day we were at a visit, I was six years old. And I, I just didn't understand why we couldn't go home with her. I didn't understand all that stuff. I, I just knew I wanted to go home. And uh, so I asked my mom, I said, how come we can't go home with you? And she said, you just, you have to go back to Janice's. Um, we got to figure things out first. And at six years old, I said, fuck you. You don't love us anymore. And I went, sat in the back of the, the transport van and waited for my sister to be finished her visit. And then we got driven back to our foster home. So where was your father? My father was in jail. Okay. Yeah, he was in jail for what he did to my sister. Thankfully, but two years is fuck all for all that. So um, so this foster mom wanted to adopt us. And once again, what I learned recently was my dad was totally against it. He wasn't giving up his parental rights. My mom was willing because she was a good foster mom and this and that. And we always told her that she treated us good. And then, um, yeah, so the next, after I said to my mom, she missed the next visit. And my sister explained to me that mom's sick, just got to give her time. She's going to get better, you know, and we'll get to go home. So I said, okay. And so the next week we're getting dressed for visits and our social worker always showed up and called our names and we come running down, get in the van and we go. <laughs> so my sister's helping me get dressed. 
and we call this downstairs. We come running down the stairs and halfway down the stairs. And you, and this was the last time I remember being truly happy because we were going to see my mom. I was going to apologize. I was going to tell her, I'm sorry for what I said, sit on her lap, give her a hug. So as we're running down the stairs, I noticed there's my social worker, my foster mom, and another lady who turned out to be my dad's attorney. I don't know why she was there. And uh, the foster mom said, come and sit in this living room. Now, the shitty thing about that foster home was she had one living room that had crayons, papers, shitty wooden toys. And then she had a living room for her real kids that had video games, uh, VCR, TV, nicer couches. So, yeah. So when she told us to come into that living room, I knew something was up. So... I ended, I was sitting on my foster mom's lap. The attorney was in the middle. My sister was on the, the uh, social worker's lap. And uh, the social worker said, um, something really awful happened to your mother. Right away, I knew I got this hot feeling through my body. I was only six, but I knew right away. And I looked at my sister and I realized my sister didn't clue in yet. So I was like, did she break her arm? Did she break her leg? Was she in a car accident? Uh, did a dog bite her? Like just any question I could think of to stop them from saying what they were going to say and uh yeah every answer was nope 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 and then i just i ran out of questions and they said your mother died and then my sister screamed so loud and she grabbed me and she hugged me she's like no june you're not mama not mama and i was just like and i remember staring at that social worker just listening to my sister scream so we brought my sister upstairs she cried herself to sleep I went downstairs to the veranda and this, this foster mom, Janice, who was always nice to me, always like very nourishing, except for when it came to like how she treated her kids. You know, that was the only thing I didn't like, but it was the lady I trusted after what I went through at home. So I'm sitting on the back veranda. I remember watching the sun go down and at six years old, I was thinking no one's ever going to hit my mom again. My mom's never going to be drunk again. No one's ever going to hurt her. No one's ever going to make her cry again. But I was bowling my eyes out, but I was thinking that. And then the sliding door opened and my foster mom said, quit, you're fucking wailing and slammed the door. And I stopped right there. And I was just like, holy shit. So this lady was so nice to me. <laughs> like all this shit happened. So, or that happened, sorry. And it just, it just shook me. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not sure about this lady no more, blah, blah, blah. Um, Apparently, before she died, they were talking about my uncle adopting my sister and I, my older sister. Right. A, a week before she died, um, she gave birth to my baby sister. So my grandpa won custody of my oldest sister and I, and he was going to figure out which uncle and auntie we go to live with. And then my baby sister, my uncle and auntie flew to Toronto and adopted her. The day after the adoption papers were signed, my mom killed herself. So she made sure we were taken care of first with her family. So, and then she gave herself a hot shot of heroin. And uh, the reports say she died June 8th, 1987 in a flop house surrounded by people that didn't give a shit about her. So that was pretty heartbreaking to read that. Because I knew she killed herself. I didn't know the situation. I didn't know where it happened or anything like right. that. So once I read this disclosure, I read all that shit. So uh, we are going to live with... We're going to move to an Indian reservation in Manitoba here with her brother. And uh, I remember my foster mom's dad used to come. I used to love the smell of his pipe. He'd smoke a pipe. I'd love that smell. We were allowed to eat granola when he was there for breakfast. Like all this stuff. He was a pretty cool guy. They had a, His wife was blind, so they had a seeing eye dog named Penny. I still remember that. And she was like the best dog ever. And he used to stand at the top of the stairs and he'd sing, um, today's the day the teddy bears have their pick, Nick. I'm not sure if you know that song, but yeah. he'd sing that to us with all the doors open. And then one day, as I'm laying there going to sleep, he came in there, tucked in his two real grandkids, came over to me, kissed me on the cheek, and then reached under my blanket. And yeah, and I was like, whoa, what the? And I pushed him away and I was like, what the heck? So... The next morning, as soon as I woke up, I told my foster mom, she's fucking lost her mind on me. Like she just, there's no way you'd do that, blah, blah, blah. What's wrong with you? Grab me by the arm, put me in the corner. I had to stand in the corner for about four hours. That was our punishment, the corner. So I had to stand there for about four hours. <clears throat> and then uh, 
on the day of my mom's funeral, she was helping me get dressed. And as she's doing up my zipper on my dress pants, she pulled it down again, pulled my underwear down, grabbed my penis, pulled it out and started tugging it, saying, is this what your dad used to do to you? Like just until it ripped on my zipper. So now I'm like, what the heck? Like so much has changed in this one week from this lady that I used to love, that I used to trust. It was just like horrible. So I told, it was the day of my mom's funeral too. It was right before the funeral. And I remember during the funeral, we walked in and I see my dad sitting there with two guards. He's handcuffed, shackled. There's a bunch of other shitty people that I wish didn't show up. Just like you tell the junkies and shit. And just, right. you know, the ones that were probably around my mom when she died. And then uh, they took us in the back behind this curtain and I was only six. So from my line of view, I could see cotton in her nose. I could see her lips sewn shut. Her eyes were sewn shut. I'm not sure if they do that anymore, but I could see all that. And it was just like, oh, it was really rough. So once the funeral was over, I went to my social worker and I said, hey, Donna, Janice did this to me. And I think she's mad because what her dad tried to do. So my social worker says to me, hey, just be brave and hang in there. You guys are moving soon. So I'm like, okay. So we go home and we used to have, uh, our bedtime was 5.30 in the evening. So we get home from school, do whatever homework we had to do, eat dinner. And then we have to say, mom, can we be excused from the table? And then we, right after that, we go for bath. Mom, can I be excused from the bath? So one day I yelled out, mom, can I be excused from the bath? She came in there, reached in the tub, grabbed my penis again like this and squeezed so hard that it hurt to piss for like a week. And then just after that went away, I was drying off in the bathroom. She came in there again and did the same thing and just like, it was crazy. So when I read all the disclosure, it's talking about how much I loved her, how much I said I trusted her, how I felt safe in her home. And then the day we leave to go live with my uncle, she's trying to say goodbye to us. And I ran to the plane. I didn't even look at her. I didn't look back. I just ran to the plane. So, yeah, so that's pretty friggin' traumatizing. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so we moved to my uncle's reserve. It's called Split Lake Indian Reserve here in Manitoba. And uh, I remember for the first few nights, I couldn't sleep because it's so quiet. You hear dogs once in a while. In Toronto, like, you'd hear like screaming, yelling, cops, this and that. Newmarket wasn't that bad. Did you ever see the foster mother again? No. Never saw her. Okay. No. But um, when I was 11, I think, a lady came from Toronto to interview us because we were still under Toronto care or Ontario care for some reason. And she told us that she died from a brain aneurysm. So I was like, (laughs) yeah. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks. <laughs> it was good. My sister balled her eyes out, but my sister didn't know what happened though. Right. But I was just like, yeah, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, so when we moved there, a week within getting there, um, I find out that my uncle one like sends his kids to Sunday school. So we're going to Sunday school with my cousins. Um, they leave and I tell this, there's a native priest and there's a white priest. So I tell the native priest, hey, my mom just died. Can you make sure she's in heaven? So he's like, oh, come talk to this guy. So I go to this back office. We start talking. Boom. The priest fucking makes a move on me. Like right after moving to somewhere where I thought I was safe. Right. This priest does whatever, tries to get, well, gets his hand in my pants and I just freak out and I leave. So my uncle sends us the next week, not knowing what happened because I didn't say anything. And then the priest asked me to help um, trim trees outside. Cause they're touching the church. So I said, okay. And he goes, we pray, we're going to pray for your mom. Um, we, you need healing. So we're going to do that. So I said, okay. And next thing you know, I'm face down on the ground and he did the ultimate, the ultimate sexual assault to me at six years old. And after that, he's like crying and he's like, I'm so sorry, the devil, this and temptations. And he goes, but if you say anything to anybody, I'll make sure you go back to a foster home. Now, the thing with me, I'm only six, but I know I just came from, what was it called? Uh, Catholic Children's Aid Society. So to me, I don't know there's Lutheran, there's Catholic. I didn't know all that stuff. Right. I just knew Catholic meant church. And this guy, I think it was the Lutheran church or something. But um, 
he said that, so I just thought Catholic foster home. Priest, Catholic, connected to foster home. He could probably make this happen. Right. I don't want to go back to that foster home. So I didn't end up saying anything to anyone. And then the third week, he somehow talked me into going outside again. It happened again. I went home and I told my uncle, I was like, I don't want to go to church somewhere. And I think he saw something in my eyes and he told me I don't have to go anymore. And uh, yeah, then I, life got slowly better. Um, do you do you know what residential schools are? Um, you heard of those? Is that where you, is that like a, where you actually live at the school? Yeah, but it was forced by the church to Aboriginal people, to Native people. They would come and physically take their kids from them and put them in this this school run by the church, run by nuns and priests. If you spoke your language, you got beaten up. All the girls had their braids cut off, and braids are a big thing in the Native culture. Right. And another thing, if the parents didn't give up their kids, they'd be threatened with jail. So they had no choice because if they're in jail, they can't take care of their kids, so they'd take them anyways. Right. And recently, within the last couple of years, they've been finding um, <clears throat> unmarked graves. Like they found 215 unmarked graves in uh, Kelowna, BC, around a residential school. So, and there's there's crazy stories. Like it's all coming out now. There's this thing called Truth and Reconciliation in Canada. And it's about the church. Like the Pope came to Edmonton and apologized to all the Native people for residential schools. And it's just the stories you hear are just horrific. Like it's like burnt babies in a furnace. Priests getting some of the students pregnant, like at a really early age, is just horrible. So once those went away, yeah, there's a, there's a school here in Florida, <clears throat> like a, a juvie hall where you know you stayed in the juvenile mm-hmm. hall, and this was back in the, I, I want to say it was in 1930s, 40s, and 50s, and they found a couple hundred. Uh, bodies of children Holy that were shit. in the school because what they would say is you know like back then you know you're a poor you're a poor family your kid gets in trouble he gets you know whatever a couple of years in the juvie wherever it is you know the juvie hall i forget the name of it, it, it where it is down here and uh if they showed up six months later or a month later or even two years later to go find out where their kid was or visit or something they just say oh he ran away Oh my god! And, and and nobody and they he was a bad kid anyway. He was already committing crimes, and this was back in the 30s or 40s or 50s. I forget what the name of it is. Um, it's it's a big deal down here, and oh. so I, I like I hate to even say that you know the, the when it was because I know everybody's going to be telling me in the comments section <laughs> they were screaming like it was 1978. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> there there's, there's like hundreds of bodies in <clears throat> town, and. Oh. You know, they just, you know, these are, and, and these are, you know, sadistic guards and, you know, raping the children or beating them. The kids would get in trouble and they just beat them to death. The kid didn't end up dying. They just bury the body. And who's going to believe them? There's a, yeah, the kid exactly. gone and who's going to, you going to believe the guard and the warden there and the, mm-hmm. or, or, you know, or the kid who, or a couple of kids that are saying, no, he, they beat him to death. Well, you're just a bad kid. No, he's going to, yeah, exactly. Him. Yeah. Or, or exactly. why would those kids say much at all? They're, they're locked up. You, you'll be next. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So fear. Yeah, yeah, this is almost like that, except these aren't kids that committed crimes, you know? Yeah, yeah. These are just okay, just Aboriginal or I'm sorry, Aboriginal. Um, just uh native kids. Aboriginal, native, yeah. Indigenous. Yeah, they, yeah indigenous that ended up yeah. at this uh just because they were forcefully taken away. So it's almost the and same thing, except that, they're not criminal. And they used to do that to the Indians um in, in the US. Well, yeah, the Indians were Indians, Native yeah. Indian. No, but I'm yeah. saying, I'm saying, in the U.S., I knew there were schools that they would send them to. Yep. That's exactly what's going on up here, or what was going on up here. So the same thing, the residential schools. I I think there was one in Pennsylvania where they okay. went and they put a bunch of. Uh, they call it now. They call it Orange Shirt Day. So for Truth and Reconciliation Day, which is September 30th, everyone wears an orange shirt. It says Every Child Matters. And I think what they did in Pennsylvania was they put um, teddy bears and a pair of shoes, kid shoes, for every single grave they found. So that's what they're doing up here. But I know for sure there was one in Pennsylvania. But um, so a residual of that is Indian Day School, which I went to on that reserve. It's a it's a normal school, but it's run by the government. So they send in white teachers and stuff. And grade two, 
uh, I had a teacher that I, I was a big mouth, I was a loud mouth, whatever. But she put soap in my mouth and then slapped me around while I was in there in grade two. And then in grade four, I had a teacher that used to grab us like this and pull our face up until we right. bit into our cheeks. He'd kick us over in our desk and he'd kick us while we're down. And so, and that's like a residual of residential school. So a lot of people, unfortunately, say, well, you're so long ago, get over it. The residential schools, why are you whining about it? What's wrong with you Indians? You know, it's so long ago, forget about it. And it wasn't that long ago because I went to Indian day school, which, and I'm 42. Right. Which is a residual of residential school. And I still talk to people on, because I live on a reserve right now. I live on my, my wife's reserve. And uh, I speak to people all the time that, that have been to residential school. And it's just, it's heartbreaking hearing their stories and stuff. But uh, so, yeah, so that was, that was Split Lake. Um, I learned to hunt and trap, which was awesome with my uncle. And uh, it was, it was a good time there, except for the whole priest thing. But uh, luckily, I never had to go back to church. And then uh, I forget exactly what happened, but something uh, something else happened with my sister, with um, my uncle's in-laws. So we had to move. So instead of dealing with it, we just got sent away to my uncle that adopted my my baby sister. So we're living with him. And my sister one day decides she's going to tell our baby sister, hey, Auntie Jenny was actually your mom not your auntie that died. She was your mom. Uncle Greg and Auntie Ronnie aren't your real parents. That's your auntie and uncle. So when Kara asked my uncle, my uncle sits us down and says, who the fuck told Kara this? And my sister Lisa looks at me and I'm a bad kid. So she looks at me and goes, well, I'm pretty sure it was Dale. And I'm like, fuck. So I got like a whooping on my life. <laughs> so we got sent away because they didn't want her knowing the real story. But I was, I was a bad kid. I remember one time, um, I used to go in my uncle's pockets or my auntie's pockets before school. And I'd take like, back when they had $2 bills, I'd take a $2 bill, $1 bill, and I'd buy whatever at lunch. And uh, one day I reached in his pocket and I pulled out $480. And I was like, holy shit. It's a nice lick. Yeah. So I put it in my pocket. I go to school. I'm in grade six. So I go to school and my uncle shows up. So how old would you be? 12, uh, that's what, 11, 12 years 11, old? 11. Yeah. So. So my uncle shows up to my school wearing cowboy boots, Edmonton oiler sweatpants, which is a hockey team up here. I'm not sure if you're familiar with NHL, but he's wearing NHL sweatpants with cowboy boots, a wife beater tucked in and a cowboy hat with those sunglasses that turn dark when you go outside. Right. So he shows up and I'm, I'm more embarrassed than I am scared. And my uncle's standing at the door like, where the fuck's Dan? <laughs> so he calls me out. He asked me, did you take that money? And I said, what money? And I'm, Denying it, denying it. So me being a little fat kid that loves candy, on my way home, I stop at this corner store, which is a trailer. It's called K&M. And I go there and I bought like dinosaur gummies, Dorito chips, two liter pop. And I go home with it. And my uncle's like, where the fuck did you get that? And I was like, oh, I found it in the dumpster. Yeah. He's like, what? I was like, I found it in the dumpster. <laughs> so he phones K&M. He goes, hey, was my nephew there? And he goes, yeah, the fat one. And he goes, with okay. all the money. Yeah, well, I, only, I hit it by a fence and I took 20 bucks at a time every day. So when she confirmed that I was there, he hung up. He said, get to the basement. He gave me, because that was his rent. So he gave me a lick in every day until the next month when he paid his rent. So, and I took it like a champ. I never told him where the money was. I never admitted to it. <laughs> so, but yeah, but my, my hunger got me busted. Yeah. So yeah, so after that, we moved to uh, a foster home in Winnipeg. And uh, I guess my mom's final wish, I don't know who she told, but her final wish was that me and my older sister would never be split up, that we'd be together. So even when we were supposed to move from Toronto, my one uncle didn't want me. He just wanted my sister. And then my other uncle said he'll take both of us. So that's why we ended up with that one. But my other uncle adopted a girl out of the family who's a really cool cousin of mine. So that that worked out. <laughs> But uh, so we ended up in Winnipeg. We were in a foster home together, my sister and I, and we started fighting. And I remember one time she hit me in the face about four times. And then I picked her up, slammed her on the couch, put her arms and, and legs behind her back. And I said, I'll never hit you. But if you ever touch me again, I'll fucking hurt you. So as soon as that happened, we got split up. I ended up in the emergency foster home. While I was there, I was like, I like this place. 
And then my foster dad's like, oh, you sure? He goes, you don't know the true story here, man. And I was like, well, I like it. I like it. So we decided I'd go live with him. So, um, yeah, so I lived with him. I had, they, we had this respite worker who was awesome. She was going to school to be a social worker. And he was only, I think he was only 24. And he had four of us by himself. And he had a couple uh, respite workers there. But, um, yeah, what I liked about his house was he used to sit us down in a circle and force us to talk about our past. And he would make us like, he'd force us to heal basically. And if we tried to bullshit, he'd call us on it. And then we couldn't leave the circle unless we talked about something. So a really cool guy. And the lady that was just in here helping me set this whole thing up, that's right. our respite worker. Cause once she stopped working for him, they started dating and then they got married. And now I live like 50 minutes away from them in a different town. So, so everything worked out. They're the best people I've ever met in my life. Um, the only good foster home I've ever been in. So everything worked out there, which was awesome. And then something happened when I was there. I got in trouble. So I couldn't stay there. And I ended up in an emergency foster home. And he moved out to where she lives. They ended up getting married. And then her dad's a farmer. So they started, he started farming. Now he runs the farm and all this stuff. But I had to go to emergency foster home. And I didn't understand why I got why I had to leave. So I riled up a bunch of rounded up a bunch of friends. We went to the house we used to live in, ran through the walls, ripped up the toilets, ripped up the sinks. We did thirty thousand dollars damage. And to them, we were having a good time partying. To me, I'm like, you fucking hurt my feelings. This is me getting revenge. Because I didn't understand why I had to leave. Right. But what happened was I had assaulted one of our foster brothers, I didn't realize because they have different levels of needs. So he was a level five. And when my foster dad told me I had to leave, he goes, he's a level five. You're a level two. You're only here because I love you. And that's when I, I was like, fuck. So that's when I got put in the emergency foster home, but I still didn't fully understand it. So that's why I wanted to get revenge on him. That's why I smashed up his house. And how we got busted was the next day, I guess a real estate agent came to show it. And there's all these little brown kids laying on the floor with bottles and dust. <laughs> so, yeah, next thing you know, we hear, whoop, whoop. Winnipeg police, we're surrounding the, the house, blah, blah, blah. So I run upstairs. I try to hide in his uh, his shower, my foster dad's old shower. And then uh, I remember climbing onto the ceiling or climbing onto the, the little ledge on the roof. And then I heard, heard the dog and I was like, fuck. And then this cop's like, get down from there before you fall, you fat fuck. And I remember laughing and I was like, okay, hey, I'm going to the room. Don't bring the dog, please. So I climbed back in the window, laid down, they arrested me. And I ended up in uh, the youth center. Like, How old were you? I was 13 by then. Okay. Yeah. So I ended up in juvie and then uh, I ended up getting put in this, it's like a group home, but it's a locked group home. So it was a locked facility and, but, excuse me, but they only had, they had like um, magnetic doors. So we used to work a kitchen and we only had vending machines. So we get paid in toonies just for the vending machines. So everyone would pay me 10 toonies, line up, I'd smash the door open, and then I'd block the guards from coming. Because I was a big kid. I was 240 at 13 years old. So I'd block the guards from chasing them. They'd all run out. I'd have a big hand to change, and I'd go running. And Yeah, so I got in trouble lots for that. <laughs> and then, um, let's see, played rugby a lot most of my life. Got in trouble again when I was 16 for... Uh, Bank fraud, I think it was. Bank fraud for what? Just crappy bank fraud. Well, I was, I was with this girl. She found out I was. I told her I was twenty one. Like, okay, I have two daughters that were born when I was seventeen, so I made them when I was sixteen. Their moms. I had a full beard when I was thirteen. Their moms right. are twenty, so I told them both I was twenty one, and we ended up having kids together. So I have. I'm forty two. I have two twenty five year old daughters, but mm -hmm. um, so I was living with this girl. I was. I ran away from a group home, and I was. 14 i think i think it was 14 and she was 22 but she thought i was 25 and then one day i was reading her diary and she was kind of catching on and she's just saying she's kind of sick of me at being at the house with my friends and this and that so i was like wait she just she changed her pin number on her card to my nickname so i was like i know her fucking yeah i'm gonna go on the run so i took her bank card i did the the empty envelopes but i do it on a thursday because I knew they wouldn't catch it till Tuesday. So I could have 
Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Then they catch you on Tuesday, it'd be no good. So it was fraud over 5,000 and I got thrown in the youth center for that. Got out when I was 16. I was too big for, what did they say? I was too big for foster homes and too manipulative for group homes. So they gave me my own place. So I got my own apartment. At, actually, when I before I turned 16, I got my own apartment, lived on my own. Um, there's a part of this that I, I, I was thinking I don't want to get into because Andrew Tate got charged with human trafficking because of what he was saying. Right. So, but let's just say at 16, I kind of got into some shit. Right. And, I understand. Uh, I was living pretty good, actually. And then when I was 18, this is where the, the fun stories come in. Um, when I was 18, I had a bunch of girls around me. Where, well, first off, there was, I was going to throw this into the story because it's pretty shitty. But um, there was this girl I met who, once again, uh, was a lot older than me. And um, she told me, because I had these girls, so she told me, you either choose me and we live happy, we'll have the white picket fence, this and that, or you can pick these girls and go do your thing. Right. But I was so, I just, I didn't trust women. I didn't trust love. I didn't trust women. I didn't, it just seemed like they all left me. And like, as a kid, like my mom dying, all that shit, I just didn't want to latch on to any woman. So I thought the safest thing for myself would be to pick these girls. So she said, my cousin offered me an opportunity to go on the road with the carnival. I was like, oh, you'll be a fucking carny. Go ahead. So she went all over Canada, all over the States. And then one night there was a bunch of us sitting there. So even though I was doing illegal shit, I still had a job. And it was, it, it was Manitoba Youth and Care Network. And it was kind of like the children, Manitoba Youth and Care Network. So okay. working with foster kids, stuff like that. And it was kind of with the children's advocate of Manitoba. So one day, a bunch of us are sitting there. And I have a friend I grew up with. And she said, I need to ask you a question. It's very important. I'm not looking for sympathy. I just want an answer. So I said, okay, what's up? So she tells me that her father was convicted of molesting her and her two sisters. And he only got three months, but it was followed by three months house arrest where he legally had to stay in the same house as the victims. And I was like, that's the worst miscarriage of justice I've ever seen for a victim. And then she goes, yeah. And then obviously it happened again. This time there was four of them, her and her three sisters. So this time he got 12 months followed by three months house arrest. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, are you serious? And she's like, yeah. I was like, that's why I'm asking you Like, you work with, did you ever work with kids that were molested? And I said, not directly. I said, I just do like file work and stuff. And, and she's like, oh, okay. So you wouldn't know that? I was like, I've never seen that in my life. I've never seen somebody sent back to their victims, legally sent back to their victims. Like, and then she goes, yeah, well, it happened one more time. And he got 18 months plus three months house arrest. That's when his wife finally decided to leave him after the third conviction. She finally right. left him. So let's just say, God, is fuck. I was crying. I was like, I couldn't help it. And she's like, I'm not looking for sympathy. Like, just, I was wondering. I was like, okay, I'm so sorry, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, there was this, this one gay dude there. One of my buddies borrowed 40 bucks off me. And then he left. And then this, uh, there was, okay, so there's this one girl that her mom somehow recognized me. She used to babysit me when I was like six. Or five. So she knew me from Toronto all of a sudden in Winnipeg. And she's like, oh yeah, I knew your mom. Like, And there, I guess her grandmas grew up together. Our moms grew up together. She used to babysit me. So I started calling this person my sister. And it's a, a trans girl. So there was her and she had a trans friend with her. And she's like, oh, I thought you didn't like drugs. And I was like, I don't. Because I knew nothing about drugs by then. I did acid a couple of times when I was 16, smoked weed once in a while. And then I said, no, I don't like drugs. She goes, well, why'd you lend him 40 bucks? I was like, because he's my buddy. He always pays me back. And then she's like, he went to get crack. And I was like, what? I was like, no, he didn't. They're like, yeah, he went to get crack. So I didn't realize if you're a crackhead, you're not waiting around. You're going right to your dealer. I didn't know that because I didn't know about drugs. So I went to go try to find him where he always is. And I walked up and down there for two hours. Didn't see him. So finally, I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to call a taxi. This is 1999. So there's pay phones and shit still. So I'm on the phone calling a taxi and then uh, this guy comes from across the street carrying beer 
And he's like, who you on the phone with? And I was like, U.S. City Taxi. And he's like, ask for two of them. So I said, okay. So I asked for two, hung up. So while we're waiting, we start talking. And uh, he goes, what's your name? You're a funny motherfucker. And I was like, Dale Turcott, nice to meet you. And then he told me his name. And his first name is Kim, which is very rare for a man. And then his last name, which is a Spanish rare last name I never heard. And I was just like, holy fuck, this is her dad. Right. This was four hours after she told me what he had done. He approached me. I had no physical description of him. I didn't know if he had long hair, bald head, if he was fat, short, nothing. I just knew his name. And he approached me four hours after she told me. So I'm like thinking in my head, like, is this fate? Then I'm thinking, I'm, I was just planning on beating the shit out of him for what he did. That's it. So I said, who are you drinking with? He goes, nobody. And I said, well, I'll pay for half the beer. He goes, you pay for the cab. So I said, okay. So we go back to his place. Um, I'm not drinking. I made it look like I was drinking. I'm sitting on the couch, got a can of beer. And he's showing me how the Pink Floyd record syncs up with the Pink Floyd movie. Like he's showing me this. So, well, plus first when we, when we first got there, there's a picture of his daughter that I know. So I knew for sure it was him. Right. So I go to the bathroom, come out, and I'm like, hey, I know what you did to your daughters. And he's like, what? I was like, I know what you did to your daughters. And this dude was Jack too. So he, he took a weird stance, like not like a fighting stance, but it was just kind of a sideways, I'm ready kind of thing. And his jugular was just like, boom. So I was, I got ready and then he moved towards me. And you know, when you're ready to fight, as soon as someone moves, you're going to go. So he kind of moved towards me. I swung three times, missed every shot because he was going slow. And he reached out and he grabbed my dick. He just cupped it. And I was just like, what the fuck? So I was like, you got a half an hour to stop. No, I'm kidding. I didn't say that. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my God. <laughs> no, but as soon as he did that, I backhanded him and he went flying to the couch. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm confronting you about being a pervert and you're going to be a pervert. Right. And at this time, I'm 320 pounds. I'm six feet tall. He didn't care. I got a beard, shaved head, kind of intimidating. He didn't give a fuck. Like this guy was a true monster. So so I backhand him, we get into it, and then I remember he tagged me right in the chin. And then I kind of went back and I was leaning on the, what is it, entertainment stand. So I'm leaning there, i telling my body to move and I can't move at all. And then he gets up and he's coming towards me and I honestly thought in my head, like, he's going to rape you or something. So I everything I had, I pushed my heels to the ground and I fell on top of him. So we fell onto the couch and then... uh yeah, he kept, he started hitting me in the head and every shot he gave me, I started coming too. Right. So I started scrapping him. Another thing too, which will turn into something funny after was he wasn't wearing a belt and he had these cargo shorts on and he kept pulling them up. <laughs> so when we started scrapping, he couldn't pull them up no more. So right. I fell. So we're fighting on the couch. I ended up like putting both hands around his neck and then I moved to get like a side position and this fucking guy had a boner and I'm like, what the hell? Like this guy's a actual fucking pervert so i hit him seven times right here and uh yeah it's up to you if you want to edit this but his eyeball popped out and he hit my hand and i was just like whoa because it's still attached to muscles right so then he quit moving so i'm thinking okay he's dead so I'm, i get up and i'm like what the fuck just happened so i go and i look outside i don't know why i looked outside but you know when it's like dark out light inside the window is like a mirror Right. So I'm looking like that. I move my hand and I see something move behind me. So I turn around and he's standing there and he's got his bone here sticking out. His hand, each finger was like, because his hand was like this. So it looked like purple balloons at the end of each finger. I guess his hand was crushed and all that blood pooled. Um, eyeball hanging out, foot facing the other way, like standing there. And I honestly, I wasn't, I didn't do drugs. I wasn't drunk. But for the first time in my life, I was like, it's a fucking zombie. Right. I actually believed he was a zombie. So I'm thinking if he comes this way, I'm going that way. If he comes this way, I'm going that way. Like I'm going opposite of what, because he had a big uh, coffee table. It was between us. So whatever way he came, I was going the opposite way. I was getting the hell out of there. I was so scared. Like I'd never been that scared in my life. I seriously thought it was a zombie. <laughs> so he looks at me, he's trying to say something. And he goes, I loved my princesses. And I was like, you sick fuck. Like through that coffee table, I grabbed him, like give him like a rock bottom, grab him by the neck, slamming him to the coach. 
And I remember choking him so hard that I heard something snap. And then I looked at my hand, I went like this. I thought like I broke a finger. And then I looked at him and he's going, <clears throat> like grabbing his throat. And then I just remember making a fist and it was such a weird feeling because when I made that fist, it was like everything that ever happened to me, everything that ever happened to my sister, all the kids that I was in care with that it happened to, all the files I read about kids that were molested, like it felt like all their powers were in my head, like almost like a super punch from victims. And I remember jumping up, which wasn't that high because I'm fat, but I jumped up and I slammed it right into his forehead and he was gone. He died right there, took his last breath. But then I went to the door and he was slumped. This time I made sure he was okay or he was dead because I picked him up and I kind of shook him and I dropped him against his couch. So I went to the door, turned the handle, looked back. And I was like, now you'll never do any, now you'll never do this to anybody again. And then I ran up to him and I stomped on his, because he still had a heart on. So I stomped on his heart on and I left. And uh, yeah, so I guess the, the police, their first piece of evidence was the killer had size 14 Reeboks because we had a, a heel print on one of his thighs and a toe print on the other. All right. And uh, so I go back home and there's a bunch of girls there. This was the next day. So I'm there. Uh, the day after that, the paper comes out and I read the newspaper and there's a picture of that girl's dad. So apparently my best friend knew her dad. And she's reading the paper and she's like, oh my God. I was like, what? She's like, you killed him. I was like, I killed who? She's like, you killed your dad. And I was like, the fuck are you talking about? She goes, that night she told us that and you left. Where were you all night? I was like, I don't even know her fucking dad. And she's like, you fucking killed him. I was like, dude, I don't even know who he is. And then, yeah, next thing you know, I'm chilling with my girlfriend. The girls were still there. And there was uh, that, my best friend the one that was reading the paper, went to right. go do her laundry and then came home. And about two minutes later, there's a knock on the door. And then she opens the door and she's like, oh yeah, he's right there. So two detectives come in. They're like, Dale Turcotte? And I'll say, yeah. They're like, Dale Joseph Turcotte? And I'm like, yeah. They're like, uh, we're from homicide and robbery. So she, like, yeah. called, she called them? Yeah, while well, she was doing laundry. Yeah. <laughs> and this was, this was my best friend. Like this girl was also in foster care. She was looking for her mom because her dad kidnapped her from Manitoba and took her to, or no, kidnapped her from Ontario and brought her to Manitoba. And she never talked to her mom in all that time. And so I took her to the library back in the day before they had internet and shit. And we went through all those family names looking for her mom. Uh, and her mom got married, so she knew the new name. So we're looking, we're looking. We wrote down all the names. And I remember I was at her group home. He called all of them, nothing. And I said, don't worry, we'll go back to the library. Because she's pretty upset. She had her hopes up. And it was just like a movie. I was getting on the transit bus. And it was just like a movie. I pulled out my bus pass. And this post-it note fell. And there was three numbers on there. So I brought it inside. I said, hey, I got three more numbers. The last one she called. Hi, is this blah, blah, blah? Mom? This Tannis. Oh, my God. So after 10 years, I helped her find her mom. With the money I was making illegally, I paid for the gifts and the flight to Ontario for her to visit her mom and all that. So we were like best friends. We'd been through hell together. And she did this to me. <clears throat> right. So at the time, I'm kind of not believing she would do that to me. So I'm thinking it's all coincidence. Right. It'll come up later. What actually? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, the cops take me out of there. They didn't handcuff me or nothing. They, they said, we'll be in front. So I said, okay. So I walk out. I'm thinking right out the back, but I'm not fast. <laughs> so, right. So I get to the front door. There's two squad cars unmarked. And that cop rolls down his window. He's like, pick which one. So I said, okay. So I went, got in the back of one. And he goes, hey, we're going to go to Burger Factory to have something to eat first, okay? And I said, yeah. So I went to Burger Factory. I still wasn't handcuffed. They ordered me two burgers, fries. We ate. I was thinking did they're you, buttering. Did, did you ever ask them why they were there? Like, did you ever say... You're just going along with it. No, I'm going or, along you, with or is it just a known or I knew I knew I was fucked. No, I yeah. knew you knew, but yeah. I didn't know if you were like, hey, what's going on? This is crazy. Why are you well, talking to me? When what? we got to, when we got to the station, I don't even know that joke. guy. No. I made a quick joke when we got to the station. I was like, is this for that robbery last night? And they're like, uh, because of homicide and robbery. So but yeah, they took me to eat. I thought they were buttering me up, but they weren't, and I got to the station. They 
they're interviewing me. Uh, he's like, dude, I don't care what the story is. Just give me a story so I can write it down and we can put you inside. So I said, like, okay. okay. I said, well, how about this? Because they arrested six people from my house. The two trans girls, my best friends, hopefully my girlfriend and, and two other people. So I said, all of these people that you brought in all have charges. So how about you make me a deal as a man, not as a cop to a suspect, but man to man. You make me a deal that none of them will get made on any of their charges, and I'll give you a story. And he's like, done. So we shook hands. I gave him a story. It wasn't the real story, but I gave him a story. They let everybody out. And uh, a couple months later, all of them beat their charges. They just right. threw them all. So he was on it. He was good to his word. But what was your the girl's name? Your best friend? What was her Tadis. name? Yeah. Janice? Tannis. Janice. Oh, with a K? Canis? With, with a T. Oh, Tannis. Tannis. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so when you gave him the story, was it Tannis killed him? Yeah. <laughs> Beat him to death. I I was there. I saw the whole thing. Yeah. Never seen anything like it. She's super strong for yeah, 120 for, pounds for a tiny woman. lady. Yeah. In where were you back then, man? Yeah, I was say, she and the weirdest thing is she was wearing my shoes, <laughs> yeah. which was weird because she doesn't typically wear my shoes. I'm a I have a big shoe. Oh, that would have been good. That would have been funny. That what didn't work out that way. No. <laughs> so they gave me. Um, Tannis asked if she could say goodbye to me before they take me away. So they gave us 15 minutes together. Oh. And then, um, yeah, so I get locked up. Everyone beats their charges. I'm awaiting trial. And you know what's funny is so many lawyers came to see me to try to be my lawyer. Right. And there was one named Ken McCaffrey. He's from Winnipeg. And he has no hands. He's got like a thumb and a nub and he writes. So when he interviewed me, I was like, okay, well, nice meeting you. We get up and he goes, I guess, wait, where's my hand there? He goes, I got it. So me, I'm thinking, what the fuck do I do? So I grabbed it like this and I shook Because <laughs> fist bumps weren't too popular back then. So I'm going up the elevator and I'm like, why didn't I just fist bump him? Like, what the fuck? I shook his nub. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty You could have done with your pinky. You could have. Yeah, his little nub. Yeah, little pinky. <laughs> yeah, so finally, um, there's a, I call him the late, great Greg Brodsky. He was the best murder lawyer in Canada. He did over 500 murder cases in Canada. And uh, he just happened to be from Winnipeg. So he came to see me one day. And he goes, uh, you know who I am? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, do you want me as a lawyer? And I was like, uh, yeah, actually. Okay, what do you want from me? Tell me the story. What happened? What happened? So I start telling him. Bullshit. That couldn't have happened because this, this, and this. And there's no way that would have been like this. And I was like, fuck. What was, the story? what was the story you gave him? Oh, I f it was something about, um, he slept I, in hell. No, I, I think I said <laughs> that we were fighting and I accidentally, I had my arm over his neck and I put too much pressure and then he called bullshit on it right away. Yeah. yeah so I course. gave him a different story. He called bullshit again and he goes, I'm your lawyer. They can't record. I'm not recording. Tell me what's going on. I'll tell you the real story. And I'm like, okay. So I told him the real story. He goes, now we can work. Now we can work. He goes, what do you want from me? And I said, I'll do 10, I'll do 20. I just don't want life because right. I'm not sure how it works in the States, but in Canada, if you get life, as soon as you get out, say you get out in the 25 or the 10, you're on parole for the rest of your life. So if I have a disgruntled ex, she can say I pushed her or she saw me drinking. I get taken back for two years before they even review me. Right. So you're on parole till the day you die. So I just told him I'll do 10, I'll do 20. I just don't want life. He said, okay, I'll come see you tomorrow. So I said, okay. Come see me the next day. He goes, you plead guilty seven to 10. You plead guilty to manslaughter because I got charged with first, uh, second degree murder. So he said, you, you plead to manslaughter. He goes, you'll get seven to 10. So I said, okay. So was he was gonna in the pardon? press? Was there, were there like, was this in the press there? You said there was in the, the news, but I mean, yeah, when I told them they arrested you, were the paper, was the newspaper following the case? Uh, yeah. Yeah. They came to court and everything. Okay. So, um, so he said seven to 10, seven to 10. Uh, he said he was going to ask for seven and he told me the crown attorney was asking for 10. So it'd be somewhere in between. So I said, okay. So what he did, cause he's such a friggin' genius is he made sure we had a female judge that had kids. Right. Because I killed a child molester. Right. Boom. <laughs> yes. Oh, 
The judge ended this up giving like me a three time convicted child. Yes. Molest, right. Yeah. Okay. So she ended up giving me six years instead of seven to 10. I got six right. years. So he's a genius. But another thing, they tried to bring up his, his um, criminal record in court. And uh, the crown attorney's like, well, he's not the one on trial. Mr. Turcotte's on trial, not him. But the judge already knows the particulars. So she already knew he was a child molester and that. So, oh, I'm sure the judge had read the newspaper. They read the paper. You know, they know. Yeah. Well, they I'm know. not even sure. I'm not even sure if the paper said that he was a child molester. I don't even know. But, but I know way, for sure the, the judge knew. Brought it up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, now the funny thing, when I read the particulars of the case, um, because they found him with his pants down. Right. I guess when I tipped over that coffee table, his yeah. his ashtray flew. So when they found him during the autopsy, they found some cigarette butts in his ass crack. They tested them for semen to see if I raped him because <laughs> they found him with his past. <laughs> so when I read that, I was like, what? The fuck? And then in court, the crown attorney said um, the, the victim did not know the accused. I don't know what the motive was. In my personal opinion, Mr. Turcotte was looking to trade sex for money. In a fit of rage when the man wouldn't pay him, Mr. Turcotte beat him to death. So everyone in the courtroom laughs. Then my lawyer stands up and he goes, no offense to my client, but if I was a John, I would not pick up a 324-pound bald man. Everyone laughed, including the judge. And I was like, oh my God. So the next day in the paper, it says the Crown Attorney suggested Mr. Turcotte was a male prostitute. So all my buddies in jail are like, hey, I got chocolate bars, bro. I got chips, bro. <laughs> so, but yeah, so uh, I ended up getting six years for that. And uh, how much time do you do on six years in Canada? In Canada, they, they have something called statutory release, which is two thirds. So no matter what, I get out in four years. The only time there is an exception to that is if they have a dangerous offender who's reoffended violently or a sexual offender that didn't do all their programs, then right. they have to do all their time. Okay. But anybody else, you automatically get, you get your own two thirds and then you're on parole for the rest of the time. So I remember. So, do you also get gain time? No. no. No, no good time. You can't earn good time though. But they have, you have earlier parole, but that's only for nonviolent offenders, first time offenders. So you have which, to be first time, which, you have to be nonviolent. You are not. Well, I'm not. No. no. <laughs> Well, I remember when 9-11 happened, um, they had a, an army dude come and he told us that if you're, the hell did he say? If you're serving less than six years and you're nonviolent and you don't have weapons charges, you, if it comes down to World War III, you can serve the rest of your time out in the army. So, and I was like, well, six years, violence, <laughs> I don't qualify. <laughs> so, yeah. but um. I remember when I, first I was in uh, Stony Mountain Penitentiary in Manitoba here. And then because I didn't have any community support, because I was so young, I didn't have anyone really visiting me. Mm -hmm. They shipped me out to Saskatchewan, which is the next province. And uh, yeah, so I'm there and I ended up getting um, minimum security. Um, well, you know what that is. Yeah, because yeah, I think yeah. you were minimum, right? Uh, I was in medium and then I was in a low and then they have camps. So well, camps yeah. and a lows are basically minimum. Yeah. They call it, they, they, they call the farm. Yeah. Oh, they call okay. it the farm out here. So there's like no um, fence. Yeah. No fence. Yeah. That's like a camp. Yeah. So we got, there's like little barbed wire fence, but that's for like, cause we have livestock. Yeah. Like I worked in the slaughterhouse there. I'm doing time for manslaughter and my first job out there is slaughtering pigs. It's, oh my God. Like, how's that? Right? It's the irony. Exactly. Um, so, guys, uh, w where's your father during all this? Have you heard from him at all? Oh, like, obviously, sorry. out of prison. By yeah, now. sorry. Um, so, my father, I guess, he used to call my uncle. We're, we went to visit him the day, the day before we left to Manitoba to go with my uncle. We went to go visit him one more time. And what I read recently in my papers was that it was to let my sister know that everything that happened wasn't her fault. And it was to say goodbye to me. 
So when we went to my uncle's, he would call me once a week. He was allowed to call me on Tuesdays, I think it was. When we moved with my other uncle, um, my my dad would call, but my uncle would be like, no, he doesn't live here. So that's how our communication stopped. Okay. So, and then when I was 16, I was told that, because uh, he had that disease that Andre the Giant had, where your brain releases growth hormones. Right. So I was told that his body quit growing, but his organs kept growing. And then his lungs ended up popping and he died face down in the soup. That's what my auntie told me. So I'm like, oh, I wasn't too sad, whatever. Good riddance. So, uh, yeah, so that's, so <laughs> later on, the second time I'm in jail, I'm bored one day and I'm thinking, okay, my dad named me after him. We got taken away when I was six. So if he remarried, what if he wanted his name to live on and he renamed his new kid? after him so i'm like i wonder if i have any sibling so i get on facebook i'm bored i'm not locked up because i was the the uh inmate committee representative for our range so i don't have to lock up during the day just me and the cleaners are out so i'm on the phone and i said look up every d turcot dale turcot uh dale jr jr turcot so i sent them all the same message hey sorry to waste your time i'm not sure if you're also Dale Turcotte Jr., but if you are, please get back to me. I have a question. So the second day, the first day, everyone, oh, sorry about that. Good luck on your search. Sorry, blah, blah, blah. Excuse me. Second day, you get a message. Hey, uh, I'm not Dale Jr. I'm actually Dale Sr. If your mother was Jenny and your sister Lisa and your younger sister Kayla, let me know. So the only thing he had wrong was my younger sister was Kara, not Kayla. And my whole body went fucking cold. And I was like, there's no fucking way. I said, somebody's fucking with me. She said, what do you mean? I was like, my dad's dead. My dad died when I was 16. I said, someone's messing with me. I was like, someone knows enough about me to fuck with me. And she's like, who the hell would take their time to do that? Yeah, you reached like, out to him, bro. Yeah. So I was like, wait, that makes sense. But I kept right. telling him, like, my dad's dead. My dad's dead. So I was like, okay, hey, I have an idea. I hang up the phone. I call my foster mom, the one that lives here. And I say, hey, mom. I was like, uh, this is what's going on. What do you think? And she goes, well. What's your auntie's uncle's names? So I tell her, she's like, yeah, he's on Facebook. They have friends in common. And to tell you the truth, this looks like you with a pervert mustache and a trucker hat. And I said, oh, damn. I was like, what the fuck? So I said, okay, thank you. I hang up, call my ex back. And I was like, hey, there's one thing to let me know if that's him or not. I said, ask him this question. So I asked, hey, if this is really Big Dale, what was my imaginary friend's name? Without hesitation, he messaged back, Marby the Mop. And I was like, holy fuck, that's my dad. And I was like, I was told you died when I was 16, but I wrote him a 27-page letter, sent him pictures of his grandkids, except they were all clothed. Right. And I told him in that letter, I remember everything. And I said, when I say everything, I mean everything. I was like, so it's going to take a bit to build a relationship, but I know what you did. And I said, the life I'm living now, you guys, people like you are the bottom of the fucking the ladder here. I was like, I hate people like you. I killed somebody like you. And it probably happened because of you. Like I told him all that in the fucking letter. So um, when I got out that time, I was supposed to go see him. The first week I got out, it was set up to go see him because I was on parole. So I had to get everything approved. So everything was set up to go see him. Except when I got out, my drug phones, all my Coke phones were doing bad because people were fucking up because I wasn't around. So I stuck back to straighten those people out. And then I thought I'll go the next week. So the day I was supposed to come home from that visit, which was going to be the day that I left to go to the visit, uh, he had a seizure and he died. So, but he was over 600 pounds, seven feet tall, and he was seven foot two and he was bedridden. He had two nurses. Yeah. And then he, the year after my mom died, he met another lady and he was with her that whole time. And she was so jealous that my dad still had pictures of us and wedding pictures. She was jealous of a dead woman, but because of parole, everything was so meticulous. Me going out to the funeral, everything had to be planned. Like I had to check in with these cops, check in with those cops when I got there, check in with these cops when I got there, leave by this time. So her knowing that she moved the funeral up one day and I missed it. I didn't get to bury my dad. So, but, and you know what? I cried when he died and I'm embarrassed about that because of what he did to my sister and what I accidentally, I shouldn't have did. I shouldn't say accidentally. I shouldn't have did it, but. When I found out that he was alive, I told my sister, the one that he had sexually abused. 
Right. I told her, I was like, yo, big deal, still alive. And she got a hold of him and said, why did you do that shit to me? He told her, oh, your mom was always gone, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, that, that's, she's like, I was fucking eight years old. And my dad said to her, why don't you get off your fucking high horse? So when I just he sent her in spiral. Some, yeah, he clearly has some issues. Yeah, he's a fucking piece of shit. And the rest of the family is so nice, so good. Like he was never molested. He was never nothing like that. He just became a piece of shit on his own. And I'm so thankful because you look at statistics. I am so thankful that I ended that cycle right there. Because there's so many people like, I hate when people blame that, but I know that it is part of it. But I just don't like when people hide behind that so much. Right. And they don't try to get help. They do like, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, lots of people go through abuse and they don't end up do they don't end up becoming that that monster, yeah. you know, but yeah. some do. But yeah. Yeah, I think too many do. And then yeah. too many hide behind it. Yeah. So so what when you got out of prison after the the manslaughter charge, what what happened then? Uh well, I was gonna tell you a quick story in between okay. there. So I ended up I ended up in the the minimum. I had met a girl because we used to have socials. That's where like people from the outside can come in. You'd all sit around, have barbecues, shit like that. What's going on? So like in can't Canadian. Yeah, exactly. Like, what a place to commit crime. <laughs> Jesus. Well, that's the thing too. Like if I did my crimes in the States, I would have been doing life. Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't think there would have been. Gotten, and you'd have gotten at least 20 and yeah. done at least 15 to 17. Yeah. yeah. You'd, have, you'd have been that. That's if you got 20. You might have just ended up with 20. I don't think I would have got a chance to commit my second crime. Yeah. So no, you would have, you would have been an old, you'd still be in there. Yeah. Oh, they'd still be in there. So, yeah. So we have, we have these socials and I met my buddy's sister and we were kind of whatever. And her, her last name is actually rabbit skin. Native girl. <laughs> last name was rabbit skin. I got a kick out of that. So anyways, um, so me and her start talking, whatever. She has a, a boyfriend that's doing time with me, but he's married. So he's married. Plus he has his girl's girlfriend. So I'm like, yeah. whatever. So I end up in the minimum and we talk more because he's not doing time with me no more. I'm in the minimum. He's in the medium. And then, um, this guard that I was kind of, I wouldn't say fooling around with cause we only made out. We didn't actually go all the way. Um, she came and warned me. She's like, Hey, because of your attitude, you're going back, you're going back in the wall on Tuesday. And I was like, what? She goes, yeah. She's like, I'm not supposed to tell you, but you're going back in the wall on Tuesday, back to medium. So I'm like, fuck. And the big thing in my mind, because me and my sister, Lisa, the older sister, used to be so close, like so close. Like I'd die for her. And she didn't know, like when I got charged, the hardest thing about when that murder happened, the hardest part of the whole fucking thing was when I had to call her from the police station and tell her I got charged with second degree murder. That was the hardest part of the whole thing. But yeah, like his daughter showed up to court with my family and stuff. So they were the two, they weren't going to miss him. But, but the hardest thing was telling my sister, Lisa. And then Lisa's like, I didn't, I didn't raise no murderer. Like what the fuck? Something must have happened. Something must have, she didn't know the real story. And here in Canada, um, after you get sentenced, there's 18 months where they can bring your charge back and appeal it. So I had to stick with that story for 18 months. That was accidental, this and that. Oh, right. right. So my sister still didn't know what, was, what happened. So when I took off, or when that lady told me I was going back inside the wall, I said, how much time will I get if I take off? And the guard's like, don't take off, don't take off. I said, well, how much time will I get? And she's like, I don't know, 30 days, just don't commit any crimes. So I was like, okay. She's like, you're leaving? I was like, yeah. So I called old rabbit skin. This is a guard? <laughs> this is a guard, yeah. Yeah. So everyone said, like, oh, I old rabbit skin. Rabbit, okay. I, I called old rabbit skin and I was like, hey, you want to come pick me up? She's like, what? And I was like, yeah, I'm taking off. She's like, no way. And I was like, yeah. She's like, okay, I'll be there. How long? I was like, an hour after count. So she said, okay. Or no, an hour before count. Sorry. So before count? Before count. An hour before count. I'm risky. That, <laughs> that's nuts. I know. I should have waited till after count. But so anyway, so I, I take off. And I remember walking through the snow. And they had this, this uh, like barbed wire fence, but only three wires high. So it's like up to my knee. So I go to climb over it. And my pants get stuck. I fall over and a fucking tree pokes me in the eye. So I'm like, oh my God, I think this is a sign, blah, blah, blah. So I keep walking to the road, finally get to town. 
I look back and my trail is like zigzag because of my eyeball. Right. So I'm like, this is a bad sign. I should just go back. So I get to the pay phone, try call her three times, no answer. So I'm like, maybe I can make it back before count. All of a sudden I hear like, and this really old Chevette, look, like old ass Chevette. She's got a car seat in the back seat. So I got to squeeze into the passenger seat with this car seat back. So I'm leaning on the dashboard. And then um, I go to her house in the city for a bit, for a couple of days. And then she goes, do you want to come out to my reserve? It's safer there. So I said, yeah, let's go. So we go out to her reserve. And I remember the only hill in Saskatchewan, we found it. And we're going up the hill. The car's barely making it. I can feel her staring at me. So I'm like, do you want me to get out and walk to the top of the hill? She's like, please, I didn't want to be rude, but can you? I was like, yeah. So I got on this little shitty Chevette, walked to the top of the hill, met her there, coasted down the other side. So I was on her reserve for 16 days, but I was like, there's a pool table. The only pool table in town is at, at the grocery store. And there's all these older native people there, like buying groceries and shit and nobody to help them. So I started helping all of them. And then they had these activity days where they play volleyball. And I was there every night playing volleyball. You know, like making the youth laugh, making the kids laugh, making the elders laugh, all this other stuff. One day I'm at her house in the basement with her mom watching TV. Killer's still on the lamb. Boom, there's my picture. The only difference is my hair's cut and I don't have glasses. So I'm like, fuck. So I'm sitting there, I look at her mom, I look at her, and I was like, fuck, what am I going to do? I got no way out of there. I've been asking my friends for $85 for a bus ticket to Winnipeg. Everyone says, I got to wait till payday, got to wait till payday. She asked her friends, nobody hooked her up. And then um, I guess they had a meeting on the reserve about me. And they said, hey, you're doing a lot of good things. We're not going to turn you in. <laughs> Just don't be doing stuff like that out here. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm safe. So this is a crazy part. So they asked me, do you want a chaperone on a ski trip with the youth? No problem. Let's go. The next morning, she's like, hey, I've got $90 in my bank account. I don't know who it came from. So I phone all my friends. Wasn't me. Wasn't me. Wasn't me. She phones her people. Wasn't her. So I'm suspecting it might have been her boyfriend that's still in jail. <laughs> so with that, we buy the $85 bus ticket. She goes, do you want to stick around with a ski trip or do you want to go home? I said, you know what? might be safer. Let's just go home. Or I'm going to go home. She said, okay. Call me to make sure you got there safe. I said, okay. So I think it was like 16-hour bus ride. So I get there. Call her, tell her he made it. She's crying. And I said, what happened? Apparently, the dude that took my spot, their van ruled, and he died. So, mm. yeah, I got saved by that bus ticket, <laughs> which tripped me out. But, yeah, and then I was on the run in Winnipeg. I think I was on the run for a month and a half. And I remember they started kicking in doors of, like, my friends that had kids looking right. for me. So, because when you go, when you first go to jail, they do this. They ask us, like, 900 questions. There's questions like, did your dad want to be a florist? Did your mom want to be a mechanic? Did you ever want to be a hairdresser? What? Just weird questions, like 900 of them. And you have to do it so they can assess you. It's so right. weird. But I think they take your personality too. They take what's important to you. And they realize that my family and friends and kids are important to me. So that's why they started doing that to smoke me out. They're kicking in friends' doors that have kids. One, one thing that was funny, I got in a cab one day. And the Winnipeg Free Press, or no, Winnipeg Sun is sitting on his dashboard. And there's something that says, killer still on the lap. And I'm like, oh my God. And he's looking at it, looking at me, looking at it, looking at me. And I'm like, I was like, can you believe that? And he said, what? I was like, this dude, and I showed him a picture of the dead guy. I was like, this dude killed my twin brother. And I was like, and he's already out. And that guy's like, what? I was like, this guy here killed this guy. And I showed him a picture of me. Killed this guy. That's my twin brother. He killed him. And the piece of shit is already out of jail. The cabbie's like, no way. And I'm like, yeah, can you believe that? He's like, no. <laughs> so, and yeah, so he quit staring at me and shit. Dropped me off where I was, where I got picked up. But then I was like, you know what? Maybe it's not safe to be here. So the next day, I'm leaving that place. And there's a cop car sitting there. And I just kind of give him a hello. And I guess that was the first cop setting up to raid that house. So once they hit another house with kids, I was like, you know what? That's enough. I don't want to traumatize anyone else. I'm turning myself in. So I go to turn myself in. They ask me for ID. And I'm like, read the paper. I'm right yeah. there. Like, I'm turning myself in to be on the run because I'm on the run from a manslaughter charge. And you're asking me for ID? I'm like, well, do you have any form of ID? I was like, no. They're like, oh, you took off from prison? I'm like, yeah. Do you have prison ID? I was like, no, I got nothing. 
Read the paper. Or when people are looking for you, you don't keep the identifying <laughs> documents. <on>. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it was almost like they were going to turn me away. Like, that's what it felt like. And then they made me sit down, wait for like an hour till available unit was able to come get me. So I was just like, this is fucking crazy. So yeah, they took me in, brought me back to Saskatchewan. So I get back there and I'm on the inmate committee again. I'm the secretary. So one day I'm typing up a proposal for, so we can sell, what was it? Um, chocolate Easter bunnies. So we could sell them to the inmates to raise money for an event. So I'm typing up the proposal. That girl's boyfriend comes walking in with one of my buddies. And he's like, hey, I heard you were with Tanya. Did you get my $90? <laughs> <laughs> and she asked him, without your 90 bucks? Here's some chocolate bunnies. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so he comes in and he's like, were you with Tanya? I know. He goes, I heard you're fucking my girl. And I said, what? He goes, I heard you're fucking my girl. I was like, no. He goes, yeah, you're fucking. I was like, Tanya. Tanya, that's my girl. And I was like, I thought you were married. He said, I am. But that's my girlfriend. He's like, were you with her? And I was like, uh. Well, she doesn't know that. But, yeah. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> she didn't mention it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, so I'm, I'm standing there and, and this guy. He's like, is this a big guy? He's huge. He's done. <laughs> he's done. Been in say, who comes up to you and and tells you? Hey. Yeah, he was big. He he's been in for eighteen years, and he's tattooed from like his fingertips to his neck, like just covered. Dude was huge. Working out for eighteen years. So, I'm sitting there at the desk. I turn towards him, and he's like, "Yeah, so Tanya, that's my girl." And I was like, "Oh shit." So I'm looking at him and this, this I'll admit, I'm very embarrassed about it, but I'll admit it. He pulled out this long sharpened screwdriver and he put on a boxing glove. And I looked at him and I was like, please, John, don't kill me. And I never thought I would ever beg for my life. And I'm embarrassed to say I did, but I did. I looked him in the eyes. I said, please, John, don't kill me. And he's like, oh, you piece of shit. He's like, your sister and your family didn't realize you weren't coming home, eh? And then right when his thing went like this, like he pulled back to stab me. I remembered because I played rugby for five years. And I remember our coach taught us if you want to put anybody on their heels, shove your thumbs in their armpits and lift and push back. So I shot up from that chair, put my thumbs in his armpits, ran him against the wall. And all of a sudden he's like, hey, hey, stop, stop. And I'm like, what the fuck? And he just sounded like such a bitch. I was like, yo, so I grabbed him by the throat, took his knife away, started punching him. And he's like, okay, bro, okay, stop, bro, stop. And then we tripped over a lockbox. And then I pulled up his jacket and I was like, yeah, you're never going home. And right when I went to stab him, boom, I just saw stars and I was like, what the fuck? And all of a sudden all this blood. And then I was like, what the hell? And I kept wiping the blood and it would just be in my eyes again. And I kept going. And I realized um, my so-called friend fucking hit me with a two by four. It was nailed on the wall with nails sticking out to hang up your jacket. Ooh. So when he pulled it off the wall, there was nails sticking out. And that's what he got me with. Boom. And he hit me seven times with a two by four. Didn't knock me out, thankfully. And then um, I'm not sure if you know those big coffee urns where you make a big thing of coffee and there's like a little pipe that gets hot. Yeah. So we had a broken one in there and our doorknob was broken. So that thing, I pulled that thing out, put in the doorknob, tried to turn it and it snapped. And I was like, fuck. So I turn around and I'm wiping. I still have the knife or the screwdriver and I'm wiping that blood, wiping that blood. And then all of a sudden I hear they're playing floor hockey in the gym because the office is just off the gym. And then all of a sudden the voices got louder and I realized the door opened and both those guys ran by me. And then I went to the door and my other buddy from Winnipeg named Trent, he was there. And I was like, Trent, Trent. And I was slowly like losing consciousness, consciousness because all that blood. And then, uh, yeah, I just kind of closed my eyes and then Trent somehow picked me up <laughs> and he walked me to the gate and he, he's like, you still have the knife on you, bro. And I was like, fuck, thanks. Thanks for leaving. Yeah. So I tried to feel around with it. I finally found it and I threw it in the middle of the dome. And then the guards came rushing. So I remember that one guard was rubbing my thigh like, are you alive? And I just kept my eyes closed because she's rubbing my thigh. <laughs> but then I woke up and they thought I got stabbed in the head. So they rushed me to the hospital or whatever and asked me what happened. I didn't say. So they threw me in the hole. And then they watched the cameras. So they threw those other two guys in a hole. None of us wanted to charge each other. None of us wanted to make a statement on each other. So they let us all out. So me realizing how much of a bitch they were and actually realizing I was stronger than I thought, I challenged them both to a fight in the gym. 
me against both of them. My guys will check them for weapons. Their guys can check me for weapons. And we're going at it. So they agreed to it. Nobody else knows. I'm on my way to the gym. Boom, I get arrested. Get thrown in the hole. And I'm like, wow. So the big guy, the 18 years guy, went and told the guards, hey, this guy's planning something against us. So I ended up there. And then I was in the hole for so long. And then my sister moved to British Columbia. So I was like, well, why don't you send me to a jail out there? Then I'll have community support. Then I'll have visits. So like, okay. So they tried to send me there. And then I ended up stopping in Alberta and I got stuck in the middle of nowhere. I didn't know anybody, but I finished my three years there and it was, it was all right. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Doesn't sound all right. <laughs> I mean, in some ways it does. You guys are playing hockey and, and, and oh, yeah, hockey, chocolate, football, chocolate yeah. bunnies. I never saw a fucking chocolate bunny the whole time I was at Coleman, but, uh, uh Canada. you know, so which but, state yeah. did you do time in? Huh? Which state did you do time in Florida? Florida, okay. That's where you're originally from? Yeah, I'm from I'm from uh Tampa, but I was on the run for like three years. But when they caught me, they sent me to Coleman, which is about an hour north of Tampa. Okay. Yeah. What's so that small that you're from? Because you said, Well, I say Tampa because nobody knows my small town. Well, it's yeah. I, I'm I'm from like I'm actually from Temple Terrace. That's the one like 15 yeah. minutes outside of you know, it's almost like a suburb of Tampa, but it actually yeah. is its own city. Nobody knows that, though. Yeah. <laughs> like well, I, saw, I think someone in the comments is like, oh, I was there before or something. Yeah. Yeah, because as soon as you answered me, I was like, I want to see what kind of interview this guy is. So I started watching your stuff. And I was like, holy shit, this guy's interesting. <laughs> so, Not a great interviewer, but I am interesting. <laughs> um, so, so, so you got out and did you go live like near your sister? Cause that's pretty much your only real s kind of support, right? Yeah. So that's a person um, you're close to. It, yeah. It seems, it seems, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but yeah, no, no. Yeah, we were. Um, so I tried to get out there. I couldn't. And then one day I was talking to my foster dad, the one whose house I'm sitting in right now. Okay. And the one whose house I smashed up three thousand three thirty thousand dollars damage. So I phoned him because we stayed in contact. They wrote to me. Um, you know what I used to do while I was in there? Because there was a lot of Inuit guys, like Eskimos. A lot they, of what? Eskimos, like Inuits. Okay. And they're very, very good carvers. They order sandstone and they carve the most amazing things. So what I realized, because you could smoke back then, I realized in between paydays, because I used to run a sports book in there too. So I'd hand you this long ticket. You can make parlays. You could bet on one sport. And then you could bet pop. You bet pop. You just, then, can't, you just can't get right. <laughs> there always had to be a side hustle. That was yeah. the problem. So say you owe me 48 pop. What does that come up to? That comes up to a pack of smokes. Just pay me a pack of smokes. I'll give you a deal. So I realized these Inuit guys, these Eskimos, didn't have tobacco in between paydays because you got paid every two weeks. So what I did once, actually, I was I met another guy's sister that I had a crush on. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to get one of these guys to carver a dolphin out of soapstone. So I said, how much do I owe you for that? And he's like, oh, give me four packs of smoke. So I said, okay, pay him four packs of smoke. But then I was thinking, okay, in between, they're always trying to, do you know what a jail store is? <laughs> okay, so say you want chips. You come to me. I had one of these two. <laughs> you come to me, I'll give you two bags of chips. On payday, you have to give me three. Yeah, we, we just them, that's, that's the store. Like yeah, every, the store, yeah. every unit in Coleman had at least one, sometimes yeah. two or three stores. Yeah. It was the we, same thing. It's it. like, it's like either someone would do, sometimes they do half or some of them would do double, but yeah. Like if you bought, like if you bought $10 worth of stuff, you owed him $15 worth of yeah. stuff. Yeah. 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 We used to do buy items, but so what I realized well, I mean, was, I mean, obviously, well, we, well, we didn't have any money, so it's whatever the equivalent was. Like they'd say, yeah. okay, they'd give you a store list. They'd be like, you, you might have gotten three bags of chips and a, and maybe a six pack of soda, so you own like ten bucks, or you own like fifteen bucks. Mm -hmm. They'd give you, they go, okay, you got to give me three coffees, one creamer, a bag of chips. Like they would break it down because there's no money. Yeah. So he well, give you we do one by that dollars oh. worth. So if you got two chips, you owe me three chips. If you got two things of coffee, you owe me three things of coffee. You're about yeah. 33%, right? Yeah. So yeah. I noticed these Eskimos were, were cuffing cigarettes in between. They cuff packs of smokes, two for three. So I was like, can't wait. How much you want for that? Well, give me four packs of smokes. Well, you have no smokes right now. How about I give you two? Okay. 
or it'd be like, instead of four packs of smokes, how about I give you a pouch of tobacco? Okay. And then I started buying all these things. And one day I was sick laying in my cell. For some reason, Rosie O'Donnell was on and she's talking about eBay. So I'm like, boom, I got this idea. I was like, I wonder if I send all these carvings back to my foster mom, if she could put them on eBay. So she did. And I kept buying these things for $7, selling them for 140 like sending them home, giving them sold. Like it was crazy. So when I got out, or well, okay, sorry, you asked me a question. Yeah, so I had about a year left and I was, I was in contact with my foster parents. So I had about a year left. I was talking to my foster dad on the phone. I was joking around and I said, yeah, I got about a year. I got to figure out some girl I can make fall in love with me so I come live with her. I said that as a joke. And he's like, hey, kiddo. He's like, why don't you just come home? And I was just like, holy fuck. So after everything I've done to him, after right. the murder, after not having anybody for how long, he tells me come home. And I just hear the word home. I was like, yeah, I'll come home, Pop. So when I got out, my ex came to pick me up, brought me out here uh, to the, where I live now. And then uh, I lived with them for about a week. And then I was telling my foster mom, because she's like, well, let's go apply for a job. Because we live by uh, um, Riding Mountain National Park, which is a national park, which is a big vacation spot. So she's like, well, let's go to the park and get your job. I said, like, well, my only experience is in restaurant, and I don't think they want a manslaughter with knives. She's like, shut the fuck up and get in the car. I was like, okay. <laughs> By the end of the day, I had three jobs. Two of them were restaurants. So one was bartending. So everything worked out. And then um, my ex, I guess my ex fiance, um, she had a, I forget what it's called, but they call it a tubal pregnancy, where the egg goes to their fallopian tube. Yeah. And she lost the baby. And it was the first time both of us went through that. And I just fell apart. Ended up going back to Winnipeg, which was a mistake. Hooked up with a bunch of guys I met in jail that were drug dealers. And the thing is, I'm not sure if it's the same in the States, but in Canada, if you're that young, you're in for a charge like that, you're that big. And especially if you're if you're Indian or native, you're like almost automatically in a gang. You're going to get recruited into a gang. I went four years without being in a gang somehow. And a lot of people respected that. <clears throat> so when I got out, I friends with Asians, friends with everybody. And uh, they started, well, why don't you collect money for us? We got, you need a job, collect money from people that aren't paying. So I said, okay. So one day my boss invites me over for dinner. So I go and he goes, uh, can I tell you something without you getting mad? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, you know, this isn't the movies, right? And I was like, what? He goes, this isn't Scarface. This isn't Sopranos. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you don't have to beat the shit out of people. You don't have to break bones. He's like, you're big enough. People are scared of you. And he's like, nobody's borrowing drugs off me anymore because of you. And I was like, oh, shit. So I was like, okay. Because I thought I had to be like menacing and violent. <laughs> so he ended up telling me like, you just want to drive? You want to drive for my brother? And I said, okay. So I was a driver. His brother got sick one day. So I was like, well, I know what to do. I've been watching. So took a bag of crack, sold it. Uh, one guy fell in love. One was having a baby. The other one was just lazy. So I started taking all their shifts. So I was working like 48 hours at a time, driving, making money. And then I just realized because of me, the one guy was causing beef with everybody over bullshit, knowing that I would take care of it. Right. So one day I went to his house and I was like, hey, you either make me a half partner or I'm going to beat the shit out of you in front of your wife. And he's like, I'm done, done. And I was like, what? And he goes, well, I told myself if this ever threatens me, I'm going to be done. So he gave me his work vehicle. He gave me his two work phones. Gave me the four and a half ounces of crack he had, <laughs> and I took it. And I'm not sure how the states work, or if you know about the drugs in the states. But here, if you build up a good crack phone, you can sell it for like twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars. And these Asian guys really wanted those crack phones, so I sold the two phones to them. So I had like fifty thousand and a bunch of crack. I came back to this small town where I am, and I ended up trading straight across some crack for coke. And then I started selling coke, crack. Then all of a sudden I started, I started two phones. I was hiding it from my foster parents. Like I wasn't doing drugs either at all. So I was hiding it from my foster parents. Uh, I met this woman who's now my fiance and she just hated that lifestyle. So she didn't really hang out with us or I'd lie to her and tell her I was done with that. And then uh, within two years, I was selling kilos. So next thing you know, <laughs> there's this dude at the park up here who asked me if you could buy a 40 bag off me. And I was like, well, I don't do that. I don't sell I, I've never heard of 40 bag of weed. He's like, no, no weed, Coke. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, oh, I thought you, I was like, no, no. 
but he was with a bunch of dudes. And I remember them getting on the shuttle. There's a shuttle bus from that bar. I remember them getting on a shuttle and leaving and him going, fuck, I got left behind. And it was, that wasn't a setup because I came out to piss. So there's no way they knew I was going to come out to piss when that happened. So I saw this dude get left behind. Then he asked me for a 40 bag. And then I told him like, I don't sell that, but we'll lie. I send him to my buddy. My buddy sells it to him. And then next thing you know, he's, I don't know, just a really fun dude. Like he's fun to joke around with. He was fun to hang out with. And I was like, man, like this guy's like me. So we started pulling him off, like out of Winnipeg, bringing him back out here, hanging out with him, hanging out with him when I got to Winnipeg, all this other shit. So we used to have smaller deals with each other. He introduced me to his friend, Dave. And I remember Dave, I told him, I told Trey <laughs> that I didn't like Dave. So Dave came to my house, walked right in my house. And he's like, Hey, I heard you don't like me. I was like, I don't, I get a bad feeling for me. I'll get a bad vibe. And he goes, Oh, sorry if I'm not one of your guys that's selling drugs so I can party and drink on the weekend. He goes, I do this because I got no fucking job skills. I never had job skills. I'm not educated, but I need money for my family. I have a family. I'm not here to do all the blow and go and party on the weekend. I'm here for my fucking family. So I was like, well, I kind of respect that you came up to me like that. And blah, blah, blah. So I thought he was cool. So when we did these little deals in Winnipeg, they were like, not little deals, but they're like half keys or whatever and shit. So they would meet up with me. One of us would pick the restaurant. One would pick the, the hotel. And one would pick the nightclub. Like, well, they would pick one, I'd pick the other, they pick the other, and then the next time it would change. But what we were doing was every time we made a deal, because they were coming from the next province, is what I thought. So we'd make a deal, we'd all go get clean shaven, we all go get a new outfit, we'd go sit down for dinner, we'd go do the deal, then we'd go celebrate at the bar. That's what we did every time. And every time, like I said, we got clean shaven, new outfit, this and that, so... One day he's like, Hey, well, me and him were hanging out. We did a three key deal together. Me and the, me and Trey, the, the actual cop that was with me for three months. Right. So, and I honestly had, like I told all my boys, cause I had different phones. I had the phone out here. I had two phones in a city called Brandon and then two phones in Winnipeg. And I told all my guys, I have to go do a three key deal. I don't trust these guys. I honestly think I'm going to get killed, but it's worth the risk. If you're not willing to come with me, I won't hold it against you. Just tell me no. They all said no, except for Trey. Little did I know he was an under, undercover cop. Right. So when we went to do the deal, there was probably SWAT in the parking lot and everything just in case shit went sideways. So what I think is they were waiting to get me for something bigger than three. But I told them, hey, I just got my friend pregnant. I'm going to have a kid. Like, I think this is my last deal. I have job skills. I'll put money away. I'll live comfortable. That's what I told them. And he's like, oh, cool, okay, yeah, blah, blah, blah. So he's like, hey, I want a key. And I'm thinking, like, kind of got a bad feeling. Like, how come all of a sudden you want a key when we're just good with what we're doing? I said, I'm doing one more deal for a key. All of a sudden you want it. What's going on? I just got, like, a really weird feeling. So all my friends are telling me, don't do it. Mm-hmm. Like, don't go, blah, blah, blah. So I go, because I'm an idiot. I get to the hotel room door. And uh, he's like, oh, I just want to talk to you by myself. That's what Dave says. So Trey stays in the hallway with the guy that brought me the kilo. So I was standing, I was sitting on the bed. Dave's on that side. We're talking. He's like, okay, I'm going to go get the money. Make yourself a drink. And I looked at him and I realized he had fucking stubble and he had the same jeans he had earlier. And that's what told me he was a cop for some reason. For some reason, that's what fucking, and I was like, you fucking piece of shit. And he's like, what? And I was like, fucking piece of shit. And he goes, what? I was like, you're a fucking cop. He's like, no, I'm not. I was like, you're a fucking cop. I was like, is Trey a cop? I was like, tell me Trey's not a cop. Because me and Trey, like we got, well, Mike is his real name. We got so close. And at a certain point, he came to my house crying. And I asked him what's going on. He's like, don't get mad, but I have to go home. I said, why would I get mad? He goes, my mom's sick. So I was like, go home. I'll pay for your ticket. I was like, don't come back until she's okay. And the dude cried on my shoulder, like tear stains on my fucking shoulder. Right. Crying about his mom, telling me all about his mom, the good memories. I don't want her to die. I don't know what I'll do if she doesn't die or if she dies. Sorry. When I read in the particulars, he told them that if he didn't have me at that time, he wouldn't have made it through that. That's how fucking close him and I got right. in three months. In three months. So, and the thing is, when he came to do that three key deal with me, to me, 
that meant he was willing to die with me. That's how I saw it. None of my boys were willing. He was willing. So he was my new right-hand man. So he knew everything. <laughs> so so that day, I was just like, I was looking at Dave. I was like, tell me Trey's not a cop, please. Just tell me he's not a fucking cop. And then uh, he said, what are you talking about, bro? I'm, I'm going to get the money. I was like, just I said, go get your friends, man. I was like, the jig's up. You guys got me. Congratulations. Go get your buddies. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, get out of here before I beat the shit out of you with that whiskey bottle. Because he's telling me to make a drink. I was like, get out of here before I beat the shit out of you with that whiskey bottle. And I just got up. He walked out. And then I just got on my knees and went like this in the middle of the hotel room. And you know how when like a door opens beside another door, it rattles? Right. When he went in the hallway, all of a sudden my door rattled. After it closed, it rattles. And then I heard, get on the fucking ground, get on the ground, like out in the hallway. So they took down Trey as a muse or whatever. And uh, they took down my buddy who brought the kilo. Right. So I'm just waiting for it. I'm just like this, waiting for it. Sure enough, it's an adjoining door. The hotel pops open. SWAT comes in. Get on the fucking, get on your stomach. Because I was already on the ground. So I laid on the ground. And he's like, don't fucking move. And he's jamming the whatever machine gun they have. I think AR-15s. Jammed it in my head a couple times. And I just thought, you know what? I just got out of jail for doing that much, like doing that time, whatever. I don't think I can go back. There's going to be like 10, 15. And I was thinking to, if I reach under the bed, they'll blow my head off. So I was about to do that. But then I thought, I got a baby on the way. I can't do this. Right. So I just sit, I laid there and I honestly pictured like a, a castle crumbling. And when they, when everything was said and done, they said I had 149 people under me. But this is like small time, like it wasn't like a big fucking, you know. Right. It was like street people. Like what I would do, there was a couple of times I saw these certain girls at crack houses, but they didn't smoke crack. So I'd see them walking their baby the next day in the neighborhood and I'd go up to them and be like, hey, I saw you here. You know, some crack kids. How about I give you a, a 10 pack and, you know, they're 20 bucks each. So I'd say, I'll give you a 10 pack. You bring me 130. I'll give you another one. You bring me 120, 110. Next thing you know, we're doing half and I'll give you 30 packs and we'll go halfers. So that's what I was doing, like giving work to all these single moms in the neighborhood, all these dudes that knew people. I wasn't getting nothing out of it. I wasn't doing trades. No, don't say. smile. Don't okay. smile at me. <laughs> yeah. You really, you're really, it's about people help, helping people. You're really helping the single mothers. That's what I, I hear you. I, 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 I you. Well, these are, these are people that I, I saw that didn't actually smoke crack when it was around. But they're so hanging out at crack, at crack houses. Yeah, just because they, they're family or they know the people or, you right. know. So, but yeah, <laughs> I guess we can look at it two ways. But I thought you were smiling because you thought I was getting something out of it. No, like, no. I was yeah, just no. thinking, you're like, no, like I'm helping out. The <laughs> like, I don't know about that, but okay. Yeah. I hear you. No <laughs> judgment. I'm not judging. Pamper money. <laughs> no, so, uh, yeah. So when they took me down, they said that many people were under me, but. I remember once they handcuffed me, they took me out in the hallway and Trey's laying face down. And as I walked by, he looked up at me and he's like, yes. And he put his head back down. So we, I'd like to think there was a little bit of regret, but I don't know. Cause we were, we were fucking close. And for him to say that was, I don't think he knew I was going to see what he said to the, his officers or whatever about right. that, about him not making it through that. So, and then a shitty thing, which I think was a little bit of a bitch move was I, I was so close to this dude in my, my mind, in my heart that I pled guilty before trial because I knew if I went to trial, he would have to come. And if I saw him again, I think I would break my heart. Right. Just knowing like, you know, it'd be like a black and white montage going through my head of all our good times and some eighties music, maybe Bon Jovi. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> painting yeah. together, painting a house, <laughs> high fiving. So yeah. So no. So I I played guilty just so I didn't have to see him. But I remember they they came up to me and they said, "Okay," because when I got busted, they drove me past all my stash houses in the back of that car, and then they pulled up to my girlfriend at the times, and there was cops outside. I guess she got raided. My niece and nephew were there. Uh, my stepson was there, got traumatized. They threw her on the ground, arrested her. And they said, because one day when he was over, I said, go get my scale. And she went and got it. So they said she knew about the whole operation. Right. So they said, if you take an extra year, this was the same lawyer that did my murder, by the way. 
Okay. Called me a fucking idiot for, he's like, you pretty much got away with murder. Why are you committing crimes again? <laughs> so he's like, okay, they offered you, uh, if you take an extra year, she won't go to jail. And I was like, fuck that. And then my lawyer said, what? <laughs> what do you mean? No, but then this I, whole I operation said, is her, her, is she's running this whole operation. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, I, I actually said, how much time do I have to do so she doesn't even have a criminal record? And he's like, that's my fucking guy. He goes, I'll come see you tomorrow. God. So he came back and he goes, if you do two extra years, she won't have a criminal record. Because it wasn't her, honestly, her fault. She was just, I had shit stashed in her house. She only knew where my scale was because, yeah, she saw me. I the hear you. I believe you. She did. <laughs> so I did it's that. Innocent. <laughs> she didn't know. She she thought I drove Uber. Uber. Yeah, they did have Uber back. <laughs> and then uh, they brought me a bunch of pictures, just like the movies, black and white, blown up. Who's this? Who's this? If you identify at least 10 of these people, we'll take two years off your sentence. And I said, no. Nope. Okay. Well, that's Tommy. That's <laughs> Jimmy. That's Middle Paul. name. Last name. Paul, Paul lives name. with his mom. Here's his phone number. That's <laughs> Billy. Billy. I never even liked Billy. <laughs> Because Billy actually drives Uber. <laughs> no, so I, I, I refuse to. And uh, and it's funny, too, because I recently came home where I hear, like, where I live now, a bunch of guys were in my crew. And I remind them once in a while, like, hey, you could have been in prison. <laughs> you might want to pick up lunch. Yeah, exactly. Damn. Yeah, so I, I ended up getting... Uh, Billy, you got years. this? You got this? <laughs> With your Uber? <laughs> Yeah, I got six years and one month for that. So I got a month more for drugs than I did for murder. How much time do you do on that? I did four years, but... Okay, you remember when I told you I was in that lockup facility where I used to bust the door open for people? Yeah. Okay, so their protocol was only chase down the girls and bring them back because they're at risk of being exploited. So the boys can go, just bring the girls back. So... Nobody's taking advantage of them because they're young girls, young native girls, blah, blah, blah. So that was their only protocol. So one day, one of the staff grabbed my buddy. And I'm thinking, hey, they're not supposed to touch the guys. What the fuck? So I grab him. We're playing tug of war with him. And he goes, let him go or I'll charge you with this. So I push my buddy Chris into the staff, into the guard. So he falls over, blah, blah, blah. Um, we go on the run for about a week, have fun. And then we turn ourselves in. We come back there. No harm, no foul. So I come back. All of a sudden, the cops come. I got charged with assault with a weapon for throwing a kid at this guy. You hit him with your buddy. Yeah. So we're in court and the judge is like, how'd this even get to my desk? You can't use a human being as a weapon. The whole courtroom starts laughing. So when I'm in jail for this drug charge, I, I, was, I got to be in a short film when I was on the run in Vancouver. I was on the run on a candlelight warrant. So, so I you're got, on the run doing, making movies. And you know what's funny? It was a jail movie. <laughs> okay. It was a it was a jail movie, and they even put a picture on Facebook and said, "Guess which one's the actual criminal?" So, yeah. but yeah, so I got interested in the whole process. It was pretty cool. So I started asking questions about screenplays and stuff, and this and that. So, um, my mom sent me a couple books on screenplays. I read them. So I started doing a screenplay to keep myself occupied. So as I'm writing it, this dude comes up to me and says, "Hey, Turcotte, guess who your new pro officer is?" And I look up. It's the guy I threw the kid at, the one who everybody in court laughed at. Right. So when I got out, this guy breached me 13 times. <laughs> so I, I called him one day. I said, hey, I got to bring my steps on the school. I'll be there about five, 10 minutes late for my piss test. He said, okay, I get there. There's cops waiting. Like this guy fucked me hard. Like, right. It was his revenge for the, the embarrassment, the laughter. And so I probably ended up doing maybe seven years on that sentence, seven and a half. Like altogether, I guess it does, doesn't count the time that like I was in on. installments. Yeah. Yeah. So I did four straight and then the installment plan. So, but then in the middle of that too, I got in a high speed chase. Is that his fault too? <laughs> no, no, that was mine. <laughs> and you know, what's funny is I was on the run of can I will kind of wide ward. So the house I'm sitting in now, I came to visit my parents to say goodbye because I was going to turn myself in soon. I was supposed to do a movie again. I was supposed to be a mental patient. So I phoned the, the director and I'm like, hey, I'm not going to be able to make it. Like while I'm in the high speed chase, I'm like, hey, I'm not going to be able to make it. Something come up. 
I told my girlfriend whose vehicle it was. I was like, hey, your vehicle is going to be impounded in Brandon. You got to come pick it up. Blah, blah, blah. I'll pay for whatever. I got to go. And then, yeah. You know, it's they're, crazy. Putting, they're putting out the spike strip. I got to go. That, they said there was one coming up. And they said they were ready to bring the helicopter and the canine. But uh, my buddy had coke on him, which I didn't know. And he's like, I'm going to throw it out the window. I was like, nope. I said, I'm on parole right now for, or I'm on the run for a parole violation for a kilo of coke. If you throw that, they're going to mark the spot. I'm going to get 10 more years. I was like, don't you dare. And he's like, what do we do? And then I just, I was maybe three months into actually doing coke in my life. I was like, just only one thing we can do. <gasps> Put it on. I had a, what was it? Samsung Max. I figured what it was called. Mega. Samsung Mega. There's a big phone looks normal in my hand. Mm-hmm. So I put it all on there. I was like, do what you can. He did about two. And he's like, that's all I could do. He's almost puking. I'm like, so I'm going down the road. I got a king can of Budweiser in my arm like this. And I'm just You're hyper oh, focused. Oh, it was crazy. And then when they pull us out, they put him in the back of the supervisor and he's puking in there. So he got a beating. I'm laying in the middle of the highway with semis going by, like, just like, oh, so yeah. So when we got taken in, I told him he had no idea that I was on the run. He had no idea that I took my girl's car. He didn't know what I was doing, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, why was he puking? I was like, I don't know. So he got let out. COVID? Yes. <laughs> yeah, there was no COVID back then either. But yeah, no, so I, I got so I got a crime in between there. And then I got, I think, 30 more days for unlawfully a large all that shit. Oh, my God. Yeah, and then uh, shortly after that, um, I was working on a screenplay. And I couldn't figure out, there was something bugging me, but it, I couldn't figure it out. I rewrote the screenplay twice. I went through everything twice. So I'm at home one night, I was living with my ex-girlfriend. And well, what, sorry, one day, an old friend of mine said she's having car troubles downtown. So we pulled up, I helped her out and she dropped her scale. Her scale broke. So I was like, hey, I got all my paraphernalia at home you can have, I'm done with this life. So she's like, okay, I'll go get all my baggies, bunch of scales they left behind. Gave it to her in a box. I said, here you go. I'm done with this shit. Take it. She's like, oh, thank you so much here. And she gives me a baggie. And I'm like, no, no, no. I said, I'm done. She goes, no, this is, try it. And I said, what the fuck is that? She's like, meth. I was like, no, no, no. And she goes, well, I got no money to thank you. I said, like, you don't have to thank me. We're friends. She's like, just take it. And she wouldn't shut up. So I took it. So I get home. I throw it on the fridge. Tell my ex-girlfriend. So as a joke, two weeks later, she buys a bubble. She's like, I got you a gift. And I was like, fuck off. Like a meth bubble? Throw it on the fridge. Forget about it. And about three months later, I'm working on the screenplay, trying to figure out what's wrong with it. It's driving me nuts. So I unplug everything, cover it with a sheet, uncover it, start. I can't figure out what's wrong with the screenplay. So she works midnight. So I message all my friends. I'm like, hey, do you guys want to come drink? Like I was so normal. I had a, a alcohol cabinet with alcohol still in it. <laughs> so I was like, you want to come drink? They're like, no. I was like, you want to go smoke weed? No. You want to go for a ride? Anybody need a ride? Nobody need nothing. So I'm sitting home going nuts about the screenplay. And then I was like, boom, grab the phone because I'm so bored. Typed in how to smoke meth. Of course. Of yeah. course. That's a given. I'm surprised <laughs> was, you waited this long. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the thing, I was never ever a drug guy. Like really, like before that, I tried coke for a little bit, didn't like it, quit it. So anyway, so I smoked meth. So you smoke, um, so you smoke pot, you've done coke. Yeah. You've done what other <laughs> drugs? Acid when I was 16. You don't sound like a drug guy. But, no, but I, <laughs> I mean, I, I, wasn't like, I wasn't like a hard, like I wasn't a junkie yet. That's what I mean. Like I wasn't out there trying to find stuff or sell things to buy it. You know, that, that's what I mean. So you were saying you, you, you smoked the meth. Yes. So I'm laying on the couch and everything just was like, I realized what was wrong with my screenplay. And there was a, there was a character. There was a character. I that wasn't on meth. That's there wasn't on math. Yes. There needs to be a character on math. <laughs> but I introduced a character in a flashback, but I introduced them as if they were familiar to the audience. So that's what screwed me up. So I was like, oh, okay, I got to redo this. So I redid that. And all of a sudden that's done. So I popped in another screenplay I was working on, started typing. And I typed for like four hours. So I go pick up my ex after her shift. And I'm like, oh my God. She's like, why are you whispering? I was like, I smoked that man. She's like, what? I was like, you smoked that man. I was like, he's the best thing ever. You're so focused. Boom, she started smoking. She was a welder for nine years, lost her job, took out her uh, her pension plan, lost her vehicle. We lost our house. Her kid got taken away. Like, 
how everything long collapsed. Did, how long did the, this take? Like, not even nine months. Like, wow. it didn't just collapse. And then, um, so one night, um, me and a different ex were, because we obviously split up because we're no good for each other. So um, I'm walking with this girl in Winnipeg, and there's like a three-day cold snap and a two-day blizzard. So we're walking and we walk by this, they just, they just did the, the road. So there's big snow banks and we're walking by this freezing and I see something and I was like, is that a garbage bag or a dude? And she's like, oh, that's a garbage bag. So it's okay. So I keep walking and I'm like, this is bugging me because I'm pretty sure that's a dude and it's so cold. So I go, go warm up inside. I'll be right back and go check on this guy. So I go check and you don't see anything because it's just a blizzard too though. So, so I go like this in the snow, Wait, where am I? I go like this in the snow and then I hit something. Sure enough, it's him. And he's barely breathing. So I'm like, holy shit, this guy's like going to die. So it took me six minutes to wake him up. And to wake him up, I had to grab him by the chest and like slam him because it's still big. So when I straddled him, both my legs went in the snow. And then snow went up my one leg. And then my jeans held the snow against my leg. And in that six minutes, I ended up getting frostbite. So I threw this guy over my shoulder, walked him to the the bar because they sell chicken and pizza there. So I bought him chicken pizza, phoned somebody from like a homeless shelter to come get him. It's called Main Street Project. It's like an emergency thing. So I told him, can you come get him? And then they're like, oh, we don't have a car over now. I was like, the guy almost fucking froze. And he's like, oh, you're swearing at me. So we hung up. So I asked another guy, can you please take him to this place? Don't leave till he signed in. So he said, okay. So within a week, my legs are black from frostbite. And I'm like, holy shit, this is bad. So, um, oh, I remember this to the day, two days before it happened or two days after it happened. Do you remember the guy that I told you carried me in prison? Yeah. After I got stabbed or hit in the head. Um, there was a guy that was on acid that was at this house and I came up on the elevator one day and this guy's one of the solidest guys I know, one of the craziest guys I know. I come off the elevator and he's shaking and I was like, what's wrong with you? And he starts crying, gives me a hug. I was like, what's wrong? He's like, I just saw a man get killed. And I was like, what? So he described everything that happened. I was like, who is this guy? He goes, I don't know. He's like a big Russian guy with a shaved head. He's got blue eyes. Not clicking in, not clicking in. He's like, he's from the hood. You know him. And I was like, I have no idea who that is. So he explains everything to me from the moment he walked in till the moment they put him under a futon and started asking people, you want to see a dead body? And turn him into a fucking joke. And his brother was there on acid and was petting his head like a cat, he said. He didn't realize it was a body. So anyways, um, two days later, because that happened that night after I saw John. So two days later, I'm in my house. And I'm thinking, because me and Trent were so close that if we don't hear from each other in two days, we'll message each other. And just like even an insult, what's up, squid? What's up, asshole? What's up, goof? Like the worst word in prison here is goof. Right. But we call each other, like, what's up, goof? Like just to check on each other. And... I realized like he hadn't talked to me in two days. Like what the hell? So I'm thinking when he wants to cool off, he goes to his mom's. So I roll over to phone his mom and almost like a fucking hologram. I picture John going, it was a big Russian guy. He was built with blue eyes, shaved head. And I was like, Trent's fucking dead. And what John told me was those guys are like, oh yeah, we're going to get him over here and blah, blah, blah. We're going to tell him we want this. So Trent came to deliver drugs. As soon as he walked in, someone hit him in the back of the head with a two by four. And then as he fell forward, they stabbed him in the chest and then hit him in the back of the head with a bat, stabbed him in the chest again. Why? And, the drugs? Yeah. Oh. Just to take his drugs. And uh, the only good thing about that was, I guess, Trent, he was, they said when he was breathing, his chest would go from being stabbed. So that air coming out would be, and then they said when he was dying, he was on all fours and they were still hitting him in the back of the head. And then his last breath, he looked up. And he's like, I'm not dying with my chin down or something like that. Or with my face down. Oh, no, I'm going to die chin up. That's what he said. So he's like like, trying to be solid till the end. That's a good thing because he was like, you know, to us, that's a good thing. You and I have very, very, (laughs) very different opinion. I'd rather have him not die, obviously. But but in our world, that's like you died like a man kind of thing. So shitty way to go. But... Yeah, so where was I here? Oh, yeah, so I got the frostbite. So it got really bad. 
there was like these huge wounds. They're still on my leg. It's been six and a half years and I still have the wounds. They're slowly, finally healing. I go for bandage changes every second day. But I was in my buddy's bathroom and like when they used to, at the hospital in Winnipeg, they nicknamed me the Weeping Giant because every time they took them off, they would stick and it would hurt so bad ripping them off. And I'd, I'd get like teary eyed and shit. So, um, so one day I was at my buddy's and I'm doing my bandages in his bathroom. What I used to do was just cut up like pillowcases and wrap them around them or whatever. So very sterile, by the way. Um, so he knocks on the door. He said, are you crying? I said, like, I'm not crying. And I didn't lock the door. So he opens it and he's like, holy fuck, what's wrong with your legs? I was like, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I got this. And he's like, try this. And I was like, what's that? So he hands me tinfoil and a little pipe and a lighter. And I'm like, what is that? He's like, that's down. I was like, what's down? He's like, it's fentanyl heroin. I was like, no, I'm good, bro. I'm good. I tell him to fuck off. And he keeps going, oh, you won't feel nothing if you do it. You won't feel no pain. So I hear that. I took a little hoop. You sure enough, I didn't feel nothing. friends. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, this these were the mess friends that introduced me to fentanyl. So it was already, I was already hanging around with a piece of shit crowd. So, but, uh, so I did a hoot of that, changed my bandages, no problem. So I started buying it and only doing it before I did my bandages. I keep it on me till then. And then next thing you know, I needed more and more, needed more and more. Then it became no longer medicine. It became a need. And then it was no longer recreational. It was, fuck, I need this. My body needs this. And I remember one time I was at my friend's and I fucking overdosed. And he said I was dead for three minutes. And I woke up, I guess because of my size and how much sweat there was there, they thought I had a heart attack. Because when was the last time you saw a 400-pound junkie? So they treated it as a heart attack, woke me up at the hospital. Because apparently when, when fentanyl hits your system, your lungs forget to breathe. So you can just hit somebody like this or give them compressions and they're good. You don't necessarily, necessarily need Narcan. Right. Narcan helps, but you just need to get the lungs going again. That's it. So they're giving me chest compressions thinking I had a heart attack. So that's what woke me up again. But they said I was dead for three minutes. Mm. I went back to my friend and I was like, hey, where's the rest of my shit? Smoked again. Alert. Even though I died, I was like, yeah. And it was just, yeah, the fentanyl was like, I lost more from fentanyl. Like I became homeless and everything. And I lived on the streets and I had people die beside me. I've had people die without me noticing it. I saved 51 overdoses and it still never deterred me. Like your body needs it so bad. And when you start getting dope sick off fentanyl, it's the worst thing in the world. The thoughts you have, the things you're willing to do to get it. Like, like there was a corner store with the nicest guy in the world. And I almost went there with a, a hatchet and my buddy showed up with some fentanyl. And I know if I did that to that dude, I never would have been able to live it down. Like once I was sober, I'd be like, no, fuck. as if. Mm. Like there was another a, four years in prison. Yeah. In Canada. Yeah. No, but it did. There was just, thankfully there was just lines I wouldn't cross to, to get that. My, I'm not sure if you want to know my main way of getting, it. it's not sexual or nothing, but do you know what Narcan is? Yeah. Narcan okay. is the, the stuff they give you to kind of revise you, right? It's like a, yeah, adrenaline. it reverses the opiate. So what I used to do, say, for example, you and you have a friend named Pong. We'll say talk. Say you owe me money, or you owe my buddy money. My buddy that sells fentanyl. Say you owe money. I know where Tom is. I'll go see Tom. Get Tom to my place or somebody's place, and then I'll tie up Tom, knowing he's a fentanyl addict. I'll hit him with two things in our can that put him right into dope sickness, which is the worst fucking feeling in the world. So he'll be dope sick. I'll show him a half baggie of dope, and I'll say like a half gram. And I'll say I'll give you a hoot. If you tell me where he is, once we confirm he's there, you can have this whole half grand. And when you're dope sick, you don't give a fuck. You give up your mother. Like it's, right. it's fucking nuts. It's the worst thing in the world. So yeah, so that's how I used to get my drugs. They just go get their money. They give me this percent of it. Let's say you give it to me in drugs. And it was just, and I've done that so many times, like without violence, thankfully. But uh, no, I'm, yeah. I'm sure tying the guy up to the chair, that's not. <laughs> a little bit of wiggling, I guess. <laughs> Did it with. <laughs> I did. It was very gentle. It was very. <laughs> yeah, I guess we got a different opinion on a few things. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but once like once I was into that, it was just oh, like there's uh, 
so many good people I know that fell into that, that died, that just did not deserve to die. Like just. What years were this? Uh, let's see. I got out 2017. So 2018, 2019. And then like 2019 fentanyl really hit when it picked. They call it down. It's like a mix of filler, heroin, and fentanyl, but it's mostly fentanyl. Right. So when it hit, nobody really knew what it was. And then I know people did mix, like, they'll mix meth with it and then give it to somebody without them knowing it. Mm -hmm. Or somebody will use a meth bubble without realizing there was fentanyl in it and they die like that. And uh, actually, I had one of my best friends. She she actually, uh, her biggest wish was I'd get off fentanyl. And, but she ended up in psychosis from meth and she blew her head off. And, uh, I really honestly wish she was here to see me get clean. Like she's one of my best friends and, uh, yeah, she, her mom died from cancer and she just fell apart and her brother hung himself because of their mother's death and she just couldn't handle it no more. So she did more and more drugs. And then her girlfriend broke up with her. And then she's like, is this what you want? Is this what you want? But what her girlfriend told me, because I got the full story from her, she said, because you shot guns before, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when the safety's on, there's no give at all. Like right. you can't. So if you don't realize the safety's not on and you feel a little bit of give, then you know you're fucked. So she said, right when she saw her hand flex, she had this really weird look of regret on her face. So I almost think she was trying to scare her girlfriend, but I also know she was going through some shit. She was hearing voices and shit, which she's never been through. So I don't know if it was like an accidental, if she was trying to scare her, or if it was her trying to stop the voices. It was just, it was so sad. So yeah. But yeah, my biggest wish is she was still here to see me get sober. But um, so my legs are fucked. Um, I haven't talked to my foster parents in two and a half years. Uh, my ex-girlfriend, I asked her if I can come home. She said, a lot of things have changed. My mom lives with me now. My best friend lives with me. And I have a foster kid. So I was like, okay, cool. No big deal. Like you heard like fuck, but I was like, nope, no big deal. So I hadn't talked to her in two years. My foster parents, two and a half years. My legs were killing me. I had no dope. I was sick of living that life, trying to figure out where to get dope. And um, I had a check coming up on a Friday. So I knew on Tuesday, if I went to the hospital, they'd admit me because of my legs. Mm -hmm. And I also knew they put me on anti-withdrawal meds that'll hold me off until I get my check. So my plan was, do you know what a pick line is? Yeah. Okay. So I had a pick line in my arm and my plan was when I get my check, I was going to buy all, spend it all on fentanyl, put it in the flusher for the pick line and just say goodbye. Right. I was sick of the life. I was sick of this. I was sick of not having anybody at all. Like it was just, you know, and, and the thing is, too, if you're really going to do it, you're not going to be on social media saying, I'm so sad. Oh, this and that. Give me attention. Right. So I didn't post nothing about it. I just kept up my normal happy posts, you know, trying to inspire people as a homeless junkie. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so I was going to say goodbye. And all of a sudden, so when I went to the hospital, there was COVID. So they had free Wi-Fi, free TV, free phone because you couldn't have visitors. So they gave you all that shit for free that you normally had to pay for. Right. So I got moved to this one room with a fancy like touchscreen TV that comes down. So I went on there and I logged on to Facebook and this will be three days before I was planning to kill myself. So this was Wednesday. So on Wednesday I logged in and my ex-wife messaged me and she's like, Hey, it's me. How are you doing? I had a bad dream about you last night. Please let me know you're okay. She goes, I just want to know that everything's cool. Like that you're okay. How are your legs doing? Uh, and I want to let you know I still love you. So I was like, holy fuck. I'm like, yeah, kind of weird. So I just played it off like nothing's going on. Nothing's in my head. Told her I missed her. Told her I loved her too. Kept up just talking. Like didn't want to give her any hint of what was going on. The next day, I log on again to talk to her. And I have a message from my old foster dad who I hadn't talked to in two and a half years. And he's like, hey, kiddo, wondering how are you doing? He's like, how are the legs? I hope everything's good. Hope you're healing. Uh, just want to know you're okay. You know, let me know what you're doing. Love you, kiddo. And I'm like, holy fuck. What are the chances? Like they live 15 minutes away from each other, but they hadn't spoken apparently. Cause I asked my ex-wife, have you talked to Scott? She's like, no. So they hadn't talked to each other. 
and they both reached out to me two days before and one day before I was ready to end it. Right. So I'm thinking in my head, like, this can't be coincidence. Like, let's, let's give this one more try. So, and also because I was planning on killing myself, I just thought, what's the harm of being totally honest with the, with the addictions team? It's a hospital. So I told them everything. I didn't care. I was leaving in three days. So told them everything. And then after this, they, on the third day, um, before like I was going to get my check, it was in the morning. They came and there's like, hey, we're going to do this, this, and this. If you don't mind, we're going to microdose you like this. Everything's going to be okay. We're going to get you up to here. And you won't have withdrawal and nothing. And I was like, you know what? They're working with me. These two reached out to me. Is this coincidence? And I was like, I don't think so. I was like, let's give it one more shot. So she's like, why don't you come home? So I said, okay. So I quarantined, came home. And then, uh, yeah, since I've been home, that was two and a half years ago, I think. Right. Your, so, your, your uh, wife said. Yeah. Talk. Yeah. My ex-wife. Yeah. Ex-wife. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I came home and um, I've had, in the beginning, I had three relapses. So when I came home from the third relapse, you remember I was talking about uh, Indian day school I was talking about? Yeah. So there was a class action lawsuit against the government for that. And I got... 10,000. I was supposed to get 150,000, but they said, because I don't have any, um, disfigurements or long or scars, I don't get the, the 150. Cause like it apparently doesn't, doesn't prove that I got beaten up. You got to prove right. it. Apparently trauma is not anything. So, so I got the 10 grand, the basic. And then, um, yeah, we got into an argument one night and I went to Winnipeg, trying to stay at my son's in Winnipeg. And then, um, my best friend and my brother messaged me. Well, he was my foster brother for six years. I call him my brother. They messaged me and they're both users. They knew I got that money. Mm. They're like, oh, let's meet up. So they had a free ride, spent all that fucking money. So the two grand that they released when the check first came, I got to spend with the family, get to my kids. The eight grand they released a few days later, I spent all on on drugs. And I came home, my, my wife didn't care about the, the money. She was just like... You know, you need to get help. You need to promise me this isn't going to happen again. You need to go to counseling, figure something out, make a plan, or I'm done. So is it okay? So start going to counseling about it, made a, a relapse plan so I don't relapse again, shit like that. And then, uh, yeah, it's been almost two years. I've been clean. I started doing public speaking about my life and about, it's called uh, holding on to hope. And I just tell people, like, there's, no matter what you're in, there's always a way out. There's always a way to climb out of it. Because so right. many people I know for, that are on fentanyl, they're only, only thing, they're going to end up in jail for stealing to pay for it, or they're going to end, end up, up dead. dead. Yeah. Or killing another fentanyl dealer. Like, they're going to end up in prison. Like, that's the only way I've ever seen it end. I don't know anybody else that was in my group of friends that's, that's off drugs right now. So, it's just crazy. Like, I go back to Winnipeg, I run into so many people that are just, you see them high, and I'm just like, ah, fuck. Where are you, where are you now? I live in Rolling River First Nation, which with is the your, Indian Reserve. They're with my, the ex-wife? Or, yeah. We're getting married again next year. <laughs> I'm marrying my ex-wife. Exactly. Oh. So, yeah. I always say that uh, my ex-wife is my fiance. Yeah. Um, okay. And you, you were, and you're, you're working with your, your stepmother? Your step, uh, wait, sorry, what do you, your... My foster mom? Foster mom. Thank you. No, 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 no. Oh, you're not working at, uh, I thought you were. I work at the band office. At the what? The band office. It's like um, it's like city hall for a reserve. Oh, okay. So we have a chief. We have three counselors, and they oversee the operations on the reserve. I'm the receptionist, so I'm a sexy you're the secretary. Yeah. Sexiest wow. secretary you've ever met. I'm telling you that. <laughs> um, you see me in big deals. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm just, it's like a really humble life, but it's like my wife asked me once in a while, like, are you bored out here? And I'm like, it's a good boring. Yeah. You don't have to worry about nothing. Like I'm so, I'm so content. Like I just love everything that's going on in my life, except for my legs. My legs are slowly healing, but. I, 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 guess I don't know much about, um, you know, I'm in Florida, so I don't know anything about uh, frostbite. Yeah. Uh, but what, what, well, I mean, how about, well, why is it taking so long? Um, they can't figure that out. 
like oh. they say, okay, well, you're diabetic. It might be because of that. But the thing is, That's if it. I get a wound, if I get a wound on my foot, it heals right away. Like anything on my feet heals, anything above my knees heal. It's just from just below my knee down to my ankle where those wounds are. And when one heals, it like moves around. So this will heal, the one beside it will open. Like the skin beside it will open. But thankfully, the last four months, we got new bandages that are slowly closing them. So, so yeah. So once those are done, then uh, my life is perfect. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. You, you feel, how do you feel about this? Very good. Very okay. Good. I, I look at, I looked back at where I was and I can't believe I made it out. So how do you feel about the interview? Good. Good. Yeah. Okay. Feel like we covered everything? We're good. So. I have okay. an ex that shot me. What? No. I have, I have an ex that shot me. I mean, who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> That's for real though. <laughs> I thought she blew my balls off, but oh. I have scars just above my knees where the shotgun and the bullets burnt. So they didn't actually go into me, they just burnt me. But I thought she blew my balls off mm. at first. Listen, I'm going to interview a guy who was his uh, his girl ex girlfriend. Now, obviously, his girlfriend saw a he was taking a nap, and she saw a gift card for Victoria's Secrets. Even though, and Mother's Day was in a few days, and that was her Mother's Day present. She saw he saw like a fifty or a hundred dollar gift boiled water and threw it on him on his junk on his shit oh 30 percent of his body burn he said the skin sl- how do you oh sl- sl- melted but he said he has a word he's like sloughed off him it, i mean it's listen he sent me pictures wow. horrible she Horrific. received pics. yeah i did no no he didn't send me like he, there was no it's it's full on it's bad Wow. The pink little thing. And that was for her. From her. That gift card was for her. The gift card was from her. Oh, listen, the whole thing, she's in prison right now. Like, she was on the run. She just went just nuts, just insane. Is the guy suicidal? No, he's fine. I mean, it didn't burn it off. I mean, he just lost it. Oh, okay. But he was locked. He was for 30 days. For 30 days, he was in in the hospital. You imagine how painful. That's your Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, bro. It's, it's, uh. I'll take the calm, boring, let's yeah. watch the Netflix series yeah. life over, you know? Yeah. So, no, I'm yeah. good. Over wow. the, the insanity that comes with, uh, you know, drug life. Yeah. I get the one. So my wife's very normal. She doesn't do drugs. We actually got, oh yeah, I didn't tell you that. We got divorced. We got married in prison. Okay. <clears throat> when I was there for doing my drug, my drug time, I promised her I was done selling drugs. Everything's over. <laughs> And dude, like the way we met was awesome. Like, I, you remember I told you you got three jobs when I first moved out here? Yeah. So I was a bartender and um, she came in one day. She was going to university in the city. So she came back to visit her cousin and she walked in and I was just like, holy fuck. So she's in line to get beer and there's a guy beside her talking to her and you can see like spit coming out of his mouth onto her. So I was like, oh my God, I'm going to save this chick. So she comes up <clears throat> and I grabbed her hands and I was like, Hey, sorry, babe. I didn't clean the house last night after the party. If we're going to drink, we have to go to your house tonight. And she realized what I was doing. So she's like, oh, okay. So she went, I gave her a beer. She went, sat down. Buddy comes up. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry, man. I didn't know. And I was like, no, no, no big deal. So I went and introduced myself. And that's how we ended up together. And then, uh, so when I'm in jail, I asked her at the visit, I was like, what do you feel about getting married? And she's like, yeah, sure. So I come back and I was like, hey, this is the date. And she's like, oh, you were serious? And I was like, yeah. She's like, you're serious. I was like, yeah, this is the date we're getting married. Yeah. So, I had one of the, I, I had a guy make a, I had a guy make a ring for you. Yeah. Of, the soap, the uh, soapstone. <laughs> As a different jail. I would have did that. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> no, I bought rings on the street. She's allowed to bring them in. But the cake, we try to order an actual wedding cake. Or they, instead, they just baked like on a big prison pan, a chocolate cake with like the shittiest icing. It was so dry. Like they let my niece and nephew come in. Um, a couple dudes there were like my best men, and she got to bring her sister and her brother and her mom. So it was pretty funny. But then when I got out, I didn't keep my promise, so we ended up getting divorced. So, 
That's how that works. Well, let's give it another try. Yeah. Yeah. I think this one's the one. Once in a while, I get those when she wakes up. Don't fucking leave me. She said that the other day. I was like, what? She's like, why are you trying to leave me? I was like, what are you talking about? She goes, I had a dream. I'm like, fuck you. Or she'll get those cheating dreams and she'll bug me all day about it. So luckily she's joking. She's not a psycho. So I've had those. Listen, bro. This this guy thought his wife was his girlfriend was perfectly fine. Oh, He's like, never had any problems. Never saw this coming. Oh, good. Whoa. The girl that shot me, we we're together for five months. Never had a disagreement. No argument, no disagreement, nothing. One day she goes, I heard you going back to your ex-wife. And I was like, what? And she put a shotgun to my chest. And I'm like, what? She goes, I heard you going back to your ex-wife, Laura. Once she said her name, because I never denied I was married before. Once she said her name, I was like, what the fuck? But my wife, my ex-wife and I, when we talked on Facebook, we were civil. We didn't talk. We didn't flirt. We didn't say nothing sexual to each other. Right. We were just friends. So even if she went through my Facebook, I wasn't saying anything bad to her. And then she put that shotgun to my chest. And I'm like, what the fuck? When she said Laura, I was like, oh, God. So I grabbed the shotgun, pulled it down, put it between my knees. And when I tried to pull it away from her, her finger was on the trigger. And that's what blasted. So I kind of shot myself, but she was holding the gauge. <laughs> I feel like I'd argue differently, but. Uh, so what happened with the priest? So now that I'm clean and I don't, I'm not in prison, I don't have to act tough. I, I'm off drugs. I got to deal with my childhood trauma. So what I did one night about. Three months ago, maybe. I was um, I was on Google. I couldn't sleep that night. I just thought, I wonder if this fucker's still alive. So, so I Googled his name, and something popped up right away, saying that uh, they were saying he's one of the Canada's most prolific pedophiles. He's got between five hundred and six hundred victims, and then um, also they said he got convicted for sixty of them. 60 or 30, but he only got six years. So I was just like, holy shit, that's nothing like compared to what he's done. But the church, what they did was because he had a pilot's, li pilot's license, they gave him a plane. So he would float, fly to remote communities and, and be the, the priest there and stuff. And he was part of the Boy Scouts too, Boy Scouts Canada and all that. So, um, yeah, so I, when I Googled Ralph Rowe, that came up, all that stuff. And then... It also said there's a class action lawsuit against him. So I looked into that and there's a, because uh, he, he did all this in Ontario and Manitoba. So there's a, a law firm in Ontario taking care of the class action lawsuit. And yeah, all these people are coming forward talking about what he did and stuff. And so, yeah, so hopefully he, we do get justice. Right. Is he, is he deceased or is he still alive? No, he's still alive. He's living in um, on Vancouver Island. Like living a good life, and uh, I saw on, on Reddit there was a subreddit about him. His name's Ralph Rowe, and there's a subreddit about him, but I don't think anyone's commented on there for a long time. But yeah, that's that's how how many victims he had. They said that his legacy on Native men is men that don't know how to be fathers, don't know how to be relationships properly, substance abuse, and all that, and they just left a trail of shit everywhere he went. So, but he's still alive. He's living a good life, apparently. But hopefully we get our justice right. in a year or two. So, Hey, if you like the video, do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell so you get notified of videos just like this. Leave a comment in the comment section. Uh, also, if you'd like to get in touch with Dale, uh, let me know. We're going to leave his email address uh, in, the, in, the, in the description box. And I really appreciate you guys checking out the video. And if you'd like to support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon. It's $10 a month. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. See ya.